getting hype when I aim up. Elevating that game up. Stepping up to the competition. Only first place, and that's how I'm living. I'm with it till they digging up my grave. Eating all the things up on my plate. Game face when I step up in the place. I was born and when I watched the other day. I'm in first place and that's how I'm living I'm with it till they digging up my grave Eating all the things up on my plate Game face when I step up in the place I was born and when I watched the other day Fresh out the box, stop, look, and watch. Ready yet? Get set! Welcome to The Brand Show, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Billy Nichols. You can call me The Brand. You can call me Quicksilver. Just don't call me late to lunch. And you can call me Papa Smalls, the best dad on the internet, because I left for milk and cigarettes, and I came back for your ass. I love Welcome you, Dad! <laughs> to the charcuterie board of fuckery Welcome that is now live, baby. Welcome to this charcuterie board of fuckery that we call a bunch of nerds. Thank you guys for tuning in. My name, again, is Billy. This is Chris. Uh, tonight, we have a great show ahead of us. Uh, thank you guys for those of you who are back with us after a 
a lengthy break. Uh, first yeah. of all, let me let me let me hit the cheer button for these guys. We're not gonna be able to hear it, but they're gonna be able to hear it. So, guys, for you. Wait, it broke. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> ah, technical difficulties. It's totally our thing. But it's either way, thank seconds. you guys. <laughs> we love you so much. Thank you for being here with us, night one. Um, before we get any any further, just to let you guys know, we're not gonna see any of the alerts tonight. Um, yeah. We have disabled the alert button, uh, so anything that does happen in chat, you're going to be seeing our main man, Jason Bassett. Let's see if we can... There's a cheer for Bassett. There let's, we go. Let, let's try this again. Let's 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 give you guys one just for you. This one's for you guys. It's the Brand Show episode one, and guys... Let's get ready to go! Let's get right into this now that Michael Buffer has told us it's time to rumble. Thank you guys for being here. Um, again, the crew is myself, Smalls, and Bassett. Bassett is manning the chat, our social media manager. What up, Bass? How you doing, brother? Anyway, guys, tonight, great show ahead of us. Kevin Monroe, writer and director of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2007, is with us. Kevin has worked on a lot of stuff. Kevin is going to bring us through his illustrious career and talk about a lot of the great projects that he's worked on. And, Chris, we are going to get to the bottom of of what happened with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2007, okay? So th this one's going to be good for you Turtle fans out there. This is going yeah, to buddy. be nuts. Uh, we had a great conversation with Kevin yesterday, but before we get into all that, let's talk about what this really is. What is the brand show? Why are we here? Why are we moving away from traditional streaming and into podcasting on top of our streaming schedule? Well, first of all, Chris and I decided after a long and lengthy talk and me being in the radio business and broadcast business for 16 years, that it was time to bring this to a new level, to elevate what we've already built. <clears throat> now, when I say elevate what we've already built, Chris, what have we already built? A whole hell of a lot. <laughs> now, by a whole hell of a lot, you mean a streaming channel that is part that was not partnered, affiliated within 13 days, mm -hmm. a growing YouTube channel, yep. many fantastic partnerships, yep, and a slew of amazing people that are going to be guesting on this show over the next few months. Now, to let you guys know, the show is going to run every two weeks, so every other Tuesday. So tonight you're going to see us, and then again on July 26 will be our next episode. I will get to who our guest is by the end of this episode. Our second guest is really great, too, let me tell you. Anyway, so the idea here is, is to bring together a podcast that allows you to see us, the A Bunch of Nerds crew, the Elevate crew, as we call ourselves, and, well, it gives you something different because, you know, we play Fortnite constantly. Constantly, but do you always want to watch us play Fortnite? I, I mean, always, maybe. I don't always want to play Fortnite. I don't know about you. No, I haven't touched it this season, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I I haven't even bought the Battle Pass yet, to be honest with you. But you, the one who's always Fortnite Battle Pass. What? Wait, wait. You want me? It's like your favorite. Do you want me to press, like press to that button? Because no, I will. I forgot you had that button. Well, that, 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 that. Fortnite Battle Pass. I just shit, shit out my ass, food it on my PC, cause I need me to get that Fortnite Battle Pass. I <laughs> anyway, cannot guys, take you anywhere. <laughs> you cannot take me anywhere. That is absolutely true. But let's get right into the show. This is going to be a fun one. We're going to see our weekly purchases for music and toys on every episode. We're going to pick two of our favorites or one of our favorites, one or the other. And we're going to maybe possibly drop you a hint somewhere in our set on some of our upcoming guests and some of our upcoming stuff. Thank you guys, though. Either way, let's get right into this and start with weekly purchases. Why don't Question. you lead us off? Answer. Um, where did you get that shirt? Cause I need it in a Forex immediately. I got it at target actually. God damn. <laughs> I know targets. Target is not good with sizing. God They're damn not. you target. <laughs> God damn target. Anyway, smalls, let's get right into weekly purchases and talk about this. I got a couple behind me. I'm just going to move this off camera and, uh, well, he's still on camera, but whatever that, you know, it, 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 it works. What? Anyway, why don't you lead us off? Uh, so I haven't gotten a whole lot this week. I did get a couple in last week, uh, but my main one is for anyone that doesn't know me outside of the screen, you're watching this on right now. Um, Billy is toys and comic books. Yeah, buddy. I am, I am music primarily. Um, so I am a vinyl head or whatever that term would be at this point. Wax head, vinyl head, whatever you want to call it. Something. Um, but I got this. 
Whoa! Zarface meets Metal Face, their collaboration with MF Doom. Uh, you thank you. This guy? Oh, who the fuck that? Oh, shit. Oh! Okay. This All isn't right. a purchase. This was a gift. Shout out to Esoteric from Zarface, but... A, friend of the podcast. Let's roll. <laughs> uh, but let's let's not get too much into that now that I've spilled the soda on myself already. We're already here. <laughs> Everything's already fucked up. It's just like I said it was going to go. A charcuterie board uh-huh. fuckery. But let's yep. get back into it. MF Doom, all caps when you say my name. All yeah. caps. All caps. I want to see it in chat. All caps when you say my name. But... Um, let's talk about this collaboration, Zarface what? and MF Doom. What? Yes. Talk about it. Uh, so, I mean, anyone that doesn't know Zarface, they are, one, I didn't realize that one third of them is from this area. They're, fr- they're uh, esoteric. Let's not say Bar- where he's from, but, you he's know. He's from our area. Our area. The area. Uh, the area. <laughs> the area 51. Area, uh, area 49 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the, the the Harry Potter version of Area 51? Yeah, it's like nine and a half, but not nine and a half. Either way. So oh, anyway, man. talk about but talk yeah. about this, because this collaboration, it came together in a fucking wild way. I've heard the story, but I know I know our viewers are gonna love it. It is, yeah. So I mean it's it's Zarface is a super group. It's not just one person. Literally the um, new Wu Tang. Li- base part of it is Wu Tang. Yep. Uh Inspect the Deck is part of Zarface, as well as Esoteric. Um, and seven and a couple and seven L exactly. Thank you. And, um, you know, they're just, they're a super group. They're very much on the underground scene, uh, much like with MF doing that's how like obviously cross paths. Uh, if you think underground hip hop, you're thinking MF doom, you're thinking anywhere that wouldn't be on a poster outside of a venue. It's you find out through a friend, through a text message off of a Facebook post. Or you saw it when you're going to Magnolia Bakery on 42nd in New York City and there's like a half ripped off poster. Th- yep. This group came <laughs> together in 2013 and literally took the underground hip hop world by storm. I got to tell you, Esoteric, amazing dude. If you haven't listened to any of his stuff, um, Baskin, I'm sure link Spotify links in the chat. Yep. Um, to MF Doom, to Zarface, to 7L, to Esoteric, to Inspect a Deck. Just amazing stuff. But get back to this record. So, I mean, this record is not my personal favorite. There is another one that they have that I do enjoy a little bit more. Uh, from Zarface specifically, that is Every Hero Needs a Villain. Fucking awesome uh, but record. finding that on vinyl even through Zarface's website right now is borderline impossible. So get on that, man. We're trying to give you that money, money. Because the the resale value on vinyl is sacrilegiously preposterous right now. But, I mean, you have Close Taker, Captain Crunch, which is a phenomenal song. Uh, it's basically, Captain Crunch is actually an interesting tune because it's, obviously with MF Doom, you know one of his best records is by my, many people, myself included, with the exception of Mad Villainy. Um, is mm, food, which is Amazing MF Doom's record. record where it's all based off of food and drink. Solid record, too. Like, he literally raps about the most ridiculous meals, too. It's oh, yeah. amazing. And Captain Crunch is basically a a B-side, if you will, to that entire album encapsulated into, you know, four to five minutes. It's like the opposite, like a parallel story, um, if you will. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I picked up that um, also uh, in light of also with Zarface, uh, some news came out in your realm uh, in the toy world. What do you got? Uh, Zarface just announced a collaboration with Bear Brick, which is a Japanese oh, shit. toy. Yeah, they're owned company. by Met- they're owned by Metacom. Uh, yeah, exactly. Who owns uh, MAFX, who we mm-hmm. unboxed um, Spider-Man in episode four of Unbox. For those of you not watch who are new here, uh, we have a website or a website, a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash a website. Nerds. Bass, you can throw that in the chat if you don't mind. Let them know where to find us. Um, we'll get we'll get to that eventually. We'll we will yeah. we will talk more about that. But, you know, that kind of rolls into news and we're going to get there in a minute. I did see that picture. Uh, it was on Esoteric's Instagram earlier today. And dude, but, I'm buying that fucking thing. I, 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 mean, I know. But good luck, because it's going to be sold exclusively right now, only in Japan. Yeah, I'll I'll find a way. Don't worry. Like, <laughs> I know I, you will. You I always had find to, a way. I had to get my my hands on Zar Noir, and this was a really hard figure to get my hands on. Now, fun story about this figure. This figure actually came out of Esoteric's personal collection. Zar Noir, if you guys look on eBay, is one of the more expensive of the Zarface reaction figures done by Super Seven. And knowing who we know at Super Seven, I, I'm. 
fucking flabbergasted that I can't get one. But it was a San Diego yeah. Comic Con exclusive last year, and well, that's that is what it is. And I, I got into the game late, and that's on me. But um, yeah, it's it's funny too because I was looking into because one when I first saw this collaboration, I had zero clue how to pronounce the name of the the company that it was a collaboration with because it's like B A or B E and then like the at symbol and then R brick. So I was like, is it B A Air brick or I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I literally had to go to the website. It's all in Japanese. Like I couldn't understand a word that was looking at it. But they've also done collaborations with Stranger Things. Uh, they've done stuff with I think Suicide Squad as well, Attack on Titan, and 007. Yeah, there was um there was a big announcement about it today. Actually, now that you said that, before I get to my weekly purchases, mm -hmm. um, guys, if you want to see it, here it is, just from Zarface's um instagram it's like page a five nights and freddy's and transformers yeah. had a kid and they they <laughs> they also talked about a few others you named a few 007 is also in this set uh squid game is in this set stranger squid game. things that's the other one yep. i couldn't think of stranger things is in this set there's a there's a lot dude i'd have to screenshot this to look closer at it I but it's it's rad dude the i still have to watch stranger hot. things Dude, I'm I'm still on season one. Shut up. <laughs> and Squid Game. I haven't seen it. I still haven't seen Tiger King, for Christ's sakes. Wow. Come over this weekend. We'll watch that together. <laughs> but, guys, before we go any further, I want to talk about that bitch, Carol fucking Baskin. What? Husband whacked him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um... It, it's it's pretty fucking sweet. I, I I'm I'm watching the chat off to the side. Shout out to everybody in chat. I see you, nerd Woo. affiliated. Slenhart photo. I see you. What's up, man? Rocket Wolf seventy eight. I see you. I know Marissa and Angelica. You're both watching. Hello, um, miserability. Raul, good to see you, my friend. Hello. Uh, the world's thank you, guys. greatest of the weekend impersonator. Yeah, absolutely. The world's greatest weekend impersonator. But let's get to my t my weekly purchases. I picked. Yeah, two what you got, Playboy? Bro, I, I, I picked two out of what I got, and given our conversation before the show where you were like, you spend money like a fucking, like it's fucking water. Um, yeah, I, I, I have it's a, true. He I does. I have a WrestleMania <laughs> Elite Brutus the Barber Beefcake sitting here, and the reason I have that sitting on the set today is uh, because I got a gift from a good friend in China, actually, who works in the factories. He actually sent me oh, a nice. um, prototype, one of the test shots of the Brutus the Barber Beefcake Elite figure. Um, I, I have a new hobby and that is collecting, um, prototypes, um, when I can get them at a, a good price. This one didn't cost me anything. He sent it to me. It was a great pickup. It came in the mail earlier today. I was really excited. I was going to do an episode of unboxed on it, but I was like, why don't I do something live on the show and mm -hmm. like, you know, really show everybody that, you know, it's, you know, awesome. And that this is what a figure looks like before paint. It's funny too. I remember when you and I first started this crazy journey we've been on. Nerddom. Yeah. The uh when you said you were collecting prototypes, I'm like pro like my brain immediately goes to like prototype the game series. Right. And I'm like, "Wait, they have figures because I want those." Immediately. Give me Alex Mercer with the blade arm immediately. And Alex was Mercer like, oh. was an amazing character. I'm like, "Oh, it's an unpainted turtle." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unpainted turtles are fun, and you know what? We're going to talk a lot about un of turtles and so forth tonight when we get Kevin in here. Guys, just to let you oh, know, yeah. um, the way the show is going to break down is, is the first part of the show is going to be news, and it's going to be stuff like this. At about 8.25, we're going to go to about a two- to three-minute break to get Kevin into the room so that way we can go. And we're going to let Kevin go as long as he wants. Uh, this should be fun. I'm really excited about it. But uh, yep. in the meantime, big shout-out, big shout-out to the money man himself, uh, my man. Eric over at the Emporium of Retro and Interesting Collecting. Oh, we love Eric. We, we love, love Eric. Eric so much. But um, Eric, Eric is put, the homie. Eric put a grail in my collection today. Um, I unlocked Smalls' homie code for this one. Eric hooked <laughs> me up with a really cool figure. This is Merman from Masters of the Universe Classics. So, yes, I know you guys can see now that you can actually see the full set now that we've kind of redone everything here in the A Bunch of Nerds office. And um, y'all know I'm a big Masters of the Universe collector, and it came with the Lords you? of Power. No, no way. Never. No, it came with the Lords of Power <laughs> head, but it also came with his original styled head, which is really cool. Um, I have never seen that in, in the wild. I... I got into Mo2 Classics after a lot of people did. I also, um, you can't see it. It's all the way in the back here, but I completed a Dragon Blaster Skeletor. If you guys follow me on Instagram, at Billy Nichols Brand, you guys can see that 
you know, this is something I do, you know, for fun. Like I collect vintage figures and I, I get them going, but let's, let's not waste too much time on that. Uh, before we get to the news, I want to let you guys know that tonight's episode is brought to you by our sponsors, extreme sets, where you can use code, the brand and save 15% at extreme dash sets.com. And by miracle fruit oil, where you can use code Billy, that's going to change. I promise and save $10 on your entire purchase of the wonderful Vita brace and all miracle fruit oil products at miracle fruit oil.com. And with that, Let's get to the news. Lead us off, Smalls. All right. So we had a decent chunk of stuff actually came out, honestly, right before we went and hit go live. Uh, so I know on your end, Halloween Kills trailer speculation yep. is floating around the internet yep. now. Yep. Uh, Mattel Creations announces the No Holds Bars Ultimate for San Diego Comic Con. I am fucking out of my mind about that. And Sorry, not, I had to mark out. I'm excited. It's the worst movie of all time, and it's getting figures. This throbbing 40-year-old man-child literally called me in the middle of work as I'm on a call, scream vomiting into the phone in excitement, and I thought he was being possessed by the devil. <laughs> <laughs> but he was just being possessed by plastic. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, one more time. That's my wallet today, let me tell you. Yeah, no shit. I wish that was my wallet. <laughs> um, what else have we got? We already went over Zarface. Um, one of my favorite bands, kind of an eclectic group. I don't know if I've ever showed them you myself. Uh, the band 12 Foot Ninja, they are out of Australia. Uh, they unfortunately just announced an indefinite hiatus, canceling all future tour dates, including their European tour for 2023. We hope they come back. They are... Uh, currently without a vocalist, and it kind of just killed the whole that vibe of the band. Totally sucks. Royally yeah, it's, sucks. It's I rough. mean, for, they are for, phenomenal any, band. for any act, that, that just sucks to see. They are great. Um, and then there are two other big ones. So anyone that is a music fan, uh, for anyone in chat, Slim, Brock and Wolf, anyone that's a uh, music fan or yourself, um, Amana Marth, uh, just announced one. We Big knew their tour. new album. We knew their new album was coming out, The Great Heathen Army, which is the best album title I think they've ever had, besides Deceiver of the Gods or Twilight of the Thunder God. But they just announced what I am dubbing the second biggest tour of the year, and I will get to the first one in a second. Uh, we have Amana Marth from Norway. We have Carcass from the UK, which is. Amon Amarth and Carcass have been trying to do a tour together literally since like the early 2000s. Because Carcass has been around since the 80s. They are one of the pioneers of grindcore music and they they sell out pretty much every tour they go on. They are they are they are like the Robert Downey. They are the Iron Man of extreme music. That's uh, fucking awesome. We also have Obituary who holds a special place in my heart because one, they're one of the founders of death metal out of Florida, Love them. but they are also the very first show that I ever photographed. Whoa. That's in the breaking news, the, the now closed down, unfortunately president's rock club in Quincy mass rest in peace to the hole in the wall of the hole in the wall. I, I mean, I would, I would beg to differ that CBGB's in New York City was the hole in the wall of the hole. No, in the CBGB's wall. is the archetype of the hole in the wall, and I'm <laughs> glad I was able to go to one single show there before they Same. They, Same. they closed it down. But I got to see Life um, of Agony there, and I got to see the Misfits there. It was fucking rad. I saw Hatebreed there. Oh, great show! Great show! Chaos. Fuck. Um, but they're on there, and that is going to be wild because I always see them whenever they come out because they they alone could headline a tour. As obviously as anyone can attest to that. Uh, and then we also have the outlier of this band, this tour that I genuinely am confused by, but I am all sorts of erotically excited about. Um, <laughs> and it's going to sound even no. weirder when I say the name of the band, but Cattle Decapitation. Uh, is on this tour as well, which is wild because they are technical death metal and they have probably the most grotesque music video on the internet that you cannot get anywhere other than WorldDisgusting.com. Check your local listings. Um, but that tour just got announced today. That is my second biggest tour of the year. Only behind my favorite tour of the year because the two headlining bands are some of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, I'm also photographing this when it comes to Boston in, uh, I believe it's September, October. Where is it? 
September. November, no, December, I January? November 21st, they're playing MGM at Fenway. Nice. Uh, Lamb of God, Kill Switch Engage, and on this stretch of the tour, we have Baroness. Nice. Baroness well. is rad. But if you are any fan of those bands, depending on what date you have, we also have Baroness opening, Motionless in White, Spirit Box, Suicide Silence, Fit for an Autopsy, or Animals as Leaders, which I know Slen will be very excited about because that is the wildest fucking lineup I've ever I, heard. I'm, I'm looking at um, the chat right now, <laughs> and Slen goes, so pumped for their tour. And then I look at at what um, Amanda followed up with, and she goes, "Holy shit, what a tour!" And then nerd affiliated, and then nerd. yep, yeah, that's that's <laughs> Steve Archer. Shout out to the nerd affiliated guys, but um, yep, but let's, that uh, is that let's... is my wildest tour. So, oh, also, one big one. I don't mean to cut you off. Mm-hmm. This is hyper prevalent to you specifically and our guest as well. All right. Um, it was announced roughly four hours ago mm-hmm. that Chadwick Boseman is being posthumously not nominated for an Emmy for his performance in Marvel's What If as Star Wars T'Challa. Fuck yeah, dude. So guys, uh, with that being said, I'm 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 glad that uh, we let in with that before we move on to bringing in our guests. So uh, as many of you know, uh, Kevin Monroe is a Canadian filmmaker, director, and animator. Uh, many of you know him from his work on 2007's TMNT. Uh, beyond this, if you have seen the storyboard art like some of us go and google like ninjas uh kevin did a lot of the storyboard (laughs) art for hey arnold kevin has also crossed paths into video games and worked on midway's freaky flyers he he's done some cool stuff um he also worked on the massive hit fingerlings which is fucking wild i still am traumatized from them coming out (laughs) we're we're gonna get it we're gonna get into that here in just a minute and we're gonna Mm -hmm. talk about kevin and we're gonna let kevin just go off the rails and say whatever he wants about whoever he wants uh but like me kevin is a survivor of colon cancer so guys just to let you know let's keep that hype train going uh tonight 22% 22% of our proceeds here at the brand show are going to go and will every show go to the Colon Cancer Foundation of White Plains, New York, in honor of Kevin, myself, and folks like Chadwick Bozeman who lost their lives to this terrible, terrible disease. Let me tell you, it is not something you ever want to deal with. Please get a colonoscopy if your doctor asks you to. Um, I'm going to lead in with one more thing, guys. Uh, something new here at, at the brand show and a bunch of nerds. Uh, we have brand bucks now. Uh, stolen from Smalls, his idea. Um, Brand Bucks <laughs> will give you the opportunity to interact with the stream in a new way, um, including asking questions to our guest. So if you guys have channel points, I don't know what the channel points are set at. I think it's, let me look myself here. Um, I might not have changed it, but um, uh, ask the guest a, a question. It's a, yeah. thou- it's a thousand channel points, okay? If you're new here, if this is your first time here, use highlight my message. Um, an orange and we'll let it slide this one time. Um, but we're going to go get ready, get our guest in here. It is eight 25. We're going to take just a two minute, um, ad break for those of you who aren't, uh, with us as subs, you know, maybe sub the channel, sub the channel, wink, wink, wink. Um, but, (laughs) um, we're going to just take a quick ad break and we're going to go to break real quick and we're going to bring Kevin into the call and we're going to be right back with you guys by eight 30. So hang on. It's not even going to be that long. It's literally going to be two minutes. We're going to start just a few minutes early here with Kevin. So hang tight. We will be right back. See you in a minute.
Welcome back, nerds. This is The Brand Show. If you're just tuning in, thank you guys for being here. I was just scrolling through the chat while we were getting our, our esteemed guest this evening. We told you a little bit about him just a few minutes ago. Man, you guys are fucking awesome. I love you guys, like, so much. And, and thank you for everything you do for this channel, for us, and what you've made us over the last four years. And, you know, building to a moment like this was so fantastic. I remember having this conversation 25 minutes after surgery with Chris and then... Maybe I don't think it was that long. I, I don't even like think it was maybe, that long. I was maybe five minutes. I, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> I, 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 I had the area of my colon removed where the tumor was in April, and that's why I've been out. Um, but here's the fun. The gentleman below me and below Chris is also a, a fellow colon cancer survivor, and he is also probably one of the most talented people on the face of the planet. Now, I said it to him earlier, and I'm going to say this, and you can meet me in the comments if you disagree, and I mean this. <coughs> TMNT07 was a cult classic, and the gentleman below us is responsible for that. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this evening is Kevin Monroe. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, how's everybody doing? We, I'm, I'm pretty damn fantastic because I get to talk about Ninja Turtles. How are you? <laughs> fantastic. It's so, good to be alive. Good to be here. Oh, and you know, yeah. after all you and I have both collectively been through and how we met through the Colorectal Cancer Alliance and everything like that, you know, it, it it's nice to be on two feet and not have a throbbing yeah. pain in my sigmoid colon. Yeah. I will be honest with you, just to be actually be able to be seated and doing this. I mean, it's it's I, TMI is like a thing of the past now, but like just to be actually to be able to be seating here is this is. And I was thinking about that earlier. So it is yeah, not guys, done. this is an 18 plus stream. And, you know, the topic is going to come up. <laughs> don't don't shy if you away from it. gather that within the Let's first five minutes, minutes you basically. might need to yeah. get yourself committed. Well, <laughs> anyway, let, let's let's just get right into this. Let's let's not waste any time. Let's let's have some fun. Let's let. I'm just going to turn my mic off and let you tell them who you are and a little bit about you. And we'll just, <laughs> we're just going to get a drink and we're going to go into this. We're going to have some fun. The floor Interview is yours. Myself. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, you know what? Um, Jesus. I don't know where to start, man. I don't Anywhere Mickey. you want. I, <laughs> Anywhere uh, you know, listen, hey, I, I, heard, listen I, heard, I heard, I heard the, uh, I heard the, the, uh, we'll start at the beginning then. It's kind of funny at the animation beginning. Uh, cause I heard the, uh, I heard the Hey Arnold comment in, in the intro, which I thought was, was really cool. It's uh that's sort of, it's a little inflated. It's a lot inflated probably. I gotta be honest, but I like it because the truth is actually almost like the complete opposite. Um, whenever we first, uh, First came to LA. I was just here for just a, a couple of weeks of a of, of visit, and we were here, and uh, and and I had my portfolio from Sheridan College in Canada, and and I really wanted to get into the business so so badly, and uh, and I'd only done a year at the time, and I was so impatient because I just wanted to. I just wanted to get to it, you know. Like I just wanted oh, to yeah. start. I just wanted to start working. Right? Shopping at the bit. Let me in. Let me in. Exactly right, and so uh, and so I spent that summer while I was doing. I think I was working in a deli at the time. I did all of the assignments in the second and third year, just completely blind, right? Like just like the the, 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 un, the unmitigated balls, just to think that you can sort of self teach yourself all that stuff. The audacity, but I still, the audacity, this economy, right? <laughs> this economy, audacity. <laughs> and so yeah, and, and so I had this portfolio. I mean, like be it like however solid it was, but I, I had enough that I could just go around and kind of start showing stuff around. So uh while I was there for two weeks, I tried to get into as many portfolio reviews as I could. Uh and I did everything I could to uh talk my way into getting into Nickelodeon, uh, because I knew that they were hiring based on animation magazine back before stuff was posted online. And so I went in there and just completely just faked that I had an appointment and 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 just said like, hey, my name's Kevin Monroe and I'm here for this portfolio review and uh, and then we don't have you on the list and and I just I just basically really insisted that, that please I'm only here for a few days and I got to go back uh, if somebody could take a look and and so she said I'll see what I can do and it was this it was just this small satellite office that was off Olive Avenue for all the Angelinos here and uh, and so it was a really tiny thing and then all of a sudden like five minutes went by and uh, and. This dude came out and it was Craig Bartlett, the guy who created Hey Arnold. And they were just in their first month of making like the first season of the episode. And so he flipped through my uh, my book and then and, and, and thought there was enough in there that they offered me a couple of freelance jobs. And I started doing prop design. I went to character design, did a couple of boards and, and a lot of layout, a lot of background, a lot of drawing, like buildings and stuff like that. So and so the antithesis of, of doing a lot of storyboards and being actually important in, in, in the in the Hey Arnold story is that my very first assignment was um, was I had to design a spit 
going into Eugene's hand. Uh, there's a, there's the episode where I hear they're playing baseball in, in the yep. abandoned yep. room. If any, if that. Anybody, he goes like this. Any, yeah, yeah. And he goes, exactly what you're talking about. Right? So yeah. I've got, and I want to get a friend at some point, but I've actually got like, I, and I got paid like 500 bucks for it. So it was fantastic. And so I, I went in, I did like a turnaround with spit, like just like from all the different angles. Right? Oh. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, that's a very long story to just show that, that things are not always as cool as they look in bios. So. Well, I mean, yeah, of course things may not look that cool in bios, but I mean, you know, even something as, as minuscule as that, like I can just tell you. You know, our, our, our fan base, the brand fam, the, the, the nerd fam, the nerd army, whatever you want to call them, just don't call them late to lunch. Um, these guys love stuff like that. Like little intricate details of things like this are what, especially in animation, that's, that's what makes it special. You can, you can animate just about anything. Like when you look back at 80s animation, you know what made He-Man special is, is his transformation was so colorful and so bright. What made Silverhawk mm-hmm. so great was, is that when Quicksilver pulled his mask up he put his hand over his mask and magically it was gone small intricate details like that are just what makes things cool like a, a spit take and, and and hey arnold no way that's rad that's that's fantastic now from hey arnold there was so many other things that came on i'll let you go through start wherever you want we'll work our way to ninja turtles when we get there we get there i'm i'm in no rush to get to ninja turtles there's there's so much everything i'm reading right here there is so much interesting stuff on to to really work through and and discuss and let me let me tell you these guys are gonna love you i promise uh no that's cool uh geez what happened after that um i would say uh okay so shortly after that then the reality is, is I, I i'm canadian uh by birth uh and i uh and so i realized after being here for that little bit and trying to do those uh freelance jobs that there was such a thing as immigration law and that we needed to be here legally and so so that quickly led to hey where can i get a visa and work and at the time it would have been like say mid 90s or so uh that was when video games were really blowing up and they were really doing a lot to attract uh talent from overseas specifically europe a lot of places were trying to bring places uh talent over from there so it was a really easy sort of animation adjacent industry to uh to kind of start cutting my teeth in and so i started working in that uh my first job was at uh, shiny entertainment and that lasted a good six seven years and while we did these were the guys who did earthworm gym uh met some of the uh, classic uh, series fantastic oh it's uh, one of the greatest game it? series of all time I remember playing that in college and it was like, it was years before I would have met any of these guys. And I remember specifically uh, just playing it. And I remember just saying it, like, it just feels like you're playing a cartoon. It was just the coolest thing. And that same team did, uh, there's a bunch of Genesis games, like Cool Spot. And then there was yep. the Aladdin game, yep. Genesis oh, the, as well. Don't even get me started right? on the Aladdin or the Lion King games for the Genesis. Right. I have and PTSD so, and, and from those so stupid ostrich levels. <laughs> yeah i i think we all do especially um now that you said that aladdin just trying to go through um the underground cave on the carpet my god i almost yep. smashed my cousin's genesis <laughs> so and i rebought it on switch because i'm a glutton for punishment <laughs> it's so this, is, this is such a it's such a hearsay story but um the uh the the head game designers of a lot of that uh, of a lot of that stuff this guy named tom tanaka who ended up becoming my co-director on tmnt and uh, gutchman and head of story on ratchet and clank uh we actually met he was one of the chief designers on earthworm gym just coincidentally right amazing and, and, oh, there you amazing go. And, coincidence and it's been going on 30 years i think now i think we've known each other no i don't even say that I'll, I'll say it'll, it'll stay solidly over 20. And so, um, but yeah, no. And so it was really funny because Tom was just so sort of behind all of those mechanics. And there's another reason I brought that up and I can't remember, but anyway, so it was, uh, yeah. So that team, I did that. And that's basically where I kind of cut my teeth because day one was crazy because I went in thinking I was going to be in animation and, and I went into this company and they had just sold Earthroom Gym as a TV series and a and an action figure line. And so I went in and immediately when we were talking about doing stuff, it was always about, well, what kind of toy is it going to be and how it can be translated to a movie? And, and this was like way before it was obvious that that was supposed to happen, right? Like it, like now it sort of seems like it's all a foreground thing. So, cool. uh, so it was a really crazy sort of jump in the deep end. Well, you, you, when you, especially with toys, and I mean, I can speak to this from, well, we, we talked about it before you came on. Things in development, prototypes, test shots, everything like that. Um, anytime you merchandise and license anything, and I, I've been learning this through my 
my work with you know small toy shops where I'm 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 brought out to Toy Fair and I'm brought out to Comic Con and so forth like that. And I'm brought into rooms and they're like, Billy, sign this. <laughs> Okay, here let me show you this. This is what we're working on. Like when when Super Seven started Shira, uh, when they did the Netflix Shira figures, I saw them two years beforehand, and they were like, "You need to sign this NDA, this NDA, this NDA, and this NDA." Um, we're making a Shira TV show, and I was like, "What?" But you're right. Every everything just it it coagulates back to toys. It it comes back to how can we merchandise? I mean, look at look at my office. I mean, it's it's a you know perfect. how to merchandise. You are a merchandise at this a- point. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and I agree with that. But at 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 the same time, like it's just one of those things where you you walk into situations and then those situations devolve into everything because it's fucking chaos. And that mm-hmm. chaos is a beautiful medium that I love hearing about it. Never it never 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 gets old. It'll never get old. So. With that, to go back to Earthworm Jim for a second, you know, that was one of the pivotal series of the 90s. I, th- I think, chat, if, if you guys are, you know, paying attention to anything we're saying, everybody here has probably played Earthworm Jim. I think we all own a copy of Earthworm Jim somewhere, whether it be an original copy or it be a digital downloaded copy through the Sega Genesis collection or something like that. I, th- I think a copy of the game sold the other day graded a 7.5, sold for almost $10,000. Like, there's, there's history and lineage there. And if I'm not I am mistaken, digging my copy out of that closet after this show. God hurry damn. up and grade it <laughs> but i i think you can probably speak to this having worked on it in some facet it was that whole game was hand drawn wasn't it yeah and so and again i came in right at the end so it was funny because i came in right at the end of, of gym two and that's when there was sort of a core group in the within the company that was uh sort of with a uh, to Naple who uh was like a creator of Thrum gym and they left and formed this company called the neverhood uh that did I can't even remember the name of it. They did a bunch of claymation video games for for DreamWorks. Oh, I know I what you're remember. talking about. You're talking right. about um Krong's Krong. It, it was always like really it's it's very Clay dark Fighters. Stuff. Clay so, Fighters? Yeah, Clay Fighters. There we yeah, go. Yeah, Clay no, Fighters was Clay one Clay Fighters one. was life. Clay, Clay <laughs> Fighters is still life. What are you talking about? But like how how Earthworm Jim is sort of uh, adjacent is that right? Like just in terms of tone and it's it's just it's perfect, right? So so I came in right at the end of that sort of uh, split in the company where there was sort of half the company was sort of staying it seemed like and then half was leaving to go and do that and so I came in just as the company was kind of trying to rebrand afterwards. But the idea of seeing how yeah everything was hand drawn and they still had like all the cells there and it was all just and there was god there was there wasn't a huge animation crew either i want to say it was only like maybe five to seven don't that's quote amazing. me but i mean it was yeah that's, it was just it was small crazy. yeah that's just and it was oh wild. i was gonna say too that was the other thing uh just not to it's, it's sort of a hearsay story but uh tom was telling me uh who we were talking about earlier uh the guy who was a uh, designer on it when they were working on aladdin uh, just talking about like how different tech was, they had to go to the Disney studios and they had to bring their sketchbooks to watch the reels of Aladdin and yep. like draw ah. notes because they had to make it copies of Yet yep. somehow they were on the hook to make the game and have it delivered by X amount of time with the, the movie release, which is just shows how, uh, yeah, oh, some cool. some parts of technology development have been very, very good. Well, think, and, think and, about it back when you, when you walk back into stuff like that, game development and so forth, Earthworm Jim really changed the game because I think it was the first hand-drawn game and I mean, I mean, you've seen homages to that even to this day. Cuphead Don't Deal with the Devil was a fully cell shaded and hand drawn game. You I was know, just going to say yeah, Cuphead. You, you that look is at stuff like that. It's wildly. Just... It's insane that that's hand drawn. Yeah. And it's, it was it's so amazing. hard. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, there was like Dragon's Lair whenever I was a kid. We did oh, that, that, that was, oh like, yeah. 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 Arcade. Oh. Yep. But that was a pricey game. Even at the time, that was that play was like four quarters for one play, yeah. and it was you, know, you had to. And that was and it was just too much of a gamble as a kid if you weren't per, if you didn't really know what you were doing. And so, yeah. but it was always there was a draw on that. All of a sudden, then these these Aladdin and then the the Earthworm Jim things pop up. And yep. I just remember specifically just after clearing something in an area, not running on, but just like sitting back and just like moving them back and forth and jump. And I mean, what other game? like maybe Mortal Kombat at the time that was kind of interesting when you'd sort of see basically the, the photo kind of morphed into and it was photogenic yeah, yeah right yeah. Like that kind of felt kind of cool at the time but like the gym specifically was like that blew me away and it was years before I met them so and and you know what's crazy you think you think about that turn of the century stuff you think about you know the eight, the late 80s early 90s and how things really changed and it you know obviously it, just from what we're hearing it's it's easy to say this is something you've always wanted to do um but t- seeing where you came from where where you're working on this like earth like earthworm jim and then you say dragon's lair and it's it's time for the price is right billy fucked up moment of the night probably won't be the last folks folks 
I have never beaten Dragon Lair. I have never gotten past the first lava pit. No. Really? That is a fucking I hard fight. game. I have one up on you then for once. Mark that down in chat. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, def definitely mark that down. Smalls finally has a leg up. But let me tell you, yeah, it's, it's dude, it's revolutionary. It's it's industry changing how things change with that. And you, and you mentioned toys. Back in the day, it was going from full resin sculpts to direct injection molding. And, you know, it, it's just crazy. And it, it it's amazing where all that all came from. So it started, it started with Earthworm Jim and it started with hey arnold and it moves on from there so where was our where is our next stop on this beautiful journey you've been on <laughs> uh let's see i started you know because of the the gig at shiny it was uh it ended up sort of evolving into this thing that i i, I just planted a flag in the term creative director but it was just it was a baloney term but it was just it was as a way to negotiate a title instead of a raise at some point i think and uh but i used it to its full advantage and we really tried to just to, it was all about developing ip for a long time even whenever the company the company eventually went on to develop a video game they did enter the matrix oh. or the, the oh, video game was on that. Game. that was a I huge love. turning point for the sort of the company i think at that point so I love that game, but I I agree with the hate that game got, specifically the Xbox original version. Oh, really? Only because the fire, a game where you have to shoot that much and the firing button is the white button, which is like on the back of the controller. That's Someone needed to be fired for that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I feel that way with like games like Dying Light where you have to do parkour and you have to use the... Um, um, you I still have, have to, to play the, the second one. You have one. to use the shoulder triggers, the second Man. one. And then to shoot, it's like, why? It's, it, you know, ab absolutely frustrating and angry, angering and all that stuff. And I just, I don't know, man. Smalls, <laughs> you played Enter the Matrix more than I did. Continue, please. Yeah, it was, uh, so that game got a lot of hate, mainly because, well, I mean, we'll get into this, obviously, like we were talking earlier. Um Everyone was mad that Shredder wasn't in TM and T07. Yeah. Um, he was, Neo, though. Morpheus that's, that's, and that's Trinity weren't. It, it, exactly. My point exactly. But yeah. the main reason that game got just destroyed by everyone is the fact that there was no Neo. There was no Trinity. There was no Morpheus. There was no Cypher. Yeah. There was nothing. You had side characters from the second movie. And it was a parallel. It was the first instance of you playing a parallel story to what you saw on the movies yeah. and people are like, I just want to play, I just want to play the lobby scene from the last 20 minutes of the first movie as a game. <laughs> right. I want that too. <laughs> and that's why we got the, the matrix experience for the PS five tech demo for unreal engine five. Oh, like, that was nuts. God, I hope that becomes a thing. That was, uh, that should but, be a PSVR game when PSVR two comes out. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. But that game, I love that game. I played the, I think I burned through a disc of that game from Blockbuster. That's the oldest sentence I'll say all month, probably. But <laughs> I, I had remember... a couple games that, I, that were like that that I loved too. Oh yeah, I it was popped a was... tab soda and I loved it. Yep, and for me it was End of the Matrix, showing um, our age, Kevin, showing our age. A little bit of a newer title, you know, relatively speaking, was Burnout Three Takedown on the 360. Oh man, and then there was so much time into that game. And then, like, Tekken 4 on the PS2. Those three <laughs> games were, like, that's all that's running. It's that and three brain cells fighting for, for prominency in my head at this point. <laughs> so when I, when I, when I was 20-something and I got into this business, uh, game industry, a lot of you guys in the chat know me from that. Um, it's one of those things where, like, you know, there's always that one project that you jump on, like, before everybody else does. And I have two, okay? So the first one was Lucha Libre Heroes Del Ring, and the game sucks in everybody yep. else's <laughs> mind but mine. Like, in my mind, I'm like, this is the best thing ever! And we all have those moments. Like, Enter the Matrix is that, like, I'm looking in the chat and seeing that Path of Neo was, was Raul's favorite, one of Raul's favorite games, and Bassett played, um... Enter the Matrix. I know I played it. I enjoyed it. That yeah. that fire button being the back button was rather annoying, but I got over it. I lived. I I, I dealt with what it was for what it was. I'm like fuck it. Like if you ever played um my name I am Mayo, you have to tap the goddamn fucking touchpad a thousand times yeah. to get a goddamn trophy. Yeah, I watched you play that, and I wanted my poor to finger. Just I wanted to yeet myself through the TV. Yeet. I just want you to know I pressed the yeet button there just for you, but I I assumed. 
<laughs> but so as, as I got deeper in and Kickstarter became a thing, you know, just going back to this and like having my hands in that foray and just getting really muddy when uh, my friends at Gun Media announced that they were doing a game called Summer Camp. I, I just threw fucking money at it. I, I got an inheritance check for five grand and I, I threw it into that game and well, I lost every dime of it because, well, we know what happened. Victor Miller and, and Sean Cunningham are fighting over the rights of Friday the 13th, but Friday the 13th came from summer camp and I was like, Oh my God. And I just threw money at it. Like it was water, <laughs> water Kickstarter open. I was like, shut up and take my money. But you know, we, we all have that one project or that one thing that came out that we're passionate about. Yes. Enter the matrix was not a critical success in a lot of people's minds. Oh, but, rocket wolf. Don't even but, get me started on the power. Uh, of yeah. We'll, we'll get to the power of love in a future episode. I promise. We'll do an episode. Why the power of love was trash. But, um, Talk about being a disappointed kid on Christmas in 1988 and having it return the next day because it didn't fucking work. That's another story. Um, but, you know, we all have that one project that wasn't a critical success that we love. I, th I think everybody in the chat would agree with that. You, I'm sure you have a project that you loved more than anything from early in your career that you were just like, this is going to be fucking amazing. And everybody didn't understand your vision. You know, and it it goes yeah. on. I, I, I see more things I want to talk about. There's a few things I would love to talk about. I just don't know if we can because they never came to fruition. But um, yeah, whatever you want, man. I mean, I, 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 I see. Kingdom I'll tell Hearts. you, if we, I'll tell you if we can. And the only reason I wouldn't would be for anything legal. But then, All right. Otherwise. Well, I, I see yeah. Kingdom. I see Kingdom Hearts on on the uh, the resume. Yeah. No, it was for the animated series. Can't talk yeah. about it. Can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to talk about. That was, um, there was a period, um, jumping ahead from the video game stuff, where uh, I went from Shiny, I went to, we went and worked at Midway for a little bit. And Freaky uh, Flyers and was during that time, right? Freaky Flyers, yeah, the game that we'll get. Game. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, oh, that's, that uh, game. that's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. And uh, so, anyways, but that was a great, that was a great opportunity to sort of, uh, it, it was a great opportunity to go in and sort of, we really were going in, kind of creating this whole, mad 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 world kind of crazy like i was really into that and the guy who was the sort of the head of uh of creative at the studio was really into this world war ii time period and then there was something where somebody said something a few years earlier when we were doing wild nine where we did all these things there are all these spaceships that look like these cool 57 chevys and all these classic cars and like hey cool it's like a merc but whatever and then somebody said and i think it was a toy guy i want to say i know mean, it's a that's a broad term it's probably not PC to call somebody on the phone. but there, 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 there's a toy guy uh, and he said uh he said the only people who like retro classic designs are just artists the consumer base will will never will never enjoy it. and it's really funny because as soon as we went in we leaned in really oh, hard consumer with base. freaky flyers <laughs> and it was like, yeah. yeah so but then again yeah then you wait 10 years and then all of a sudden the consumer base just absolutely loves shit like that yeah, so, so what's whatever. old is now new again freaky flyers exactly, was yeah. fucking fun well, too everyone Yo, Freaking listen, and that was a oh, fever dude. dream with biplanes. <laughs> Here was, was another amazing. thing. That was another crazy thing. We were going on, and I had I had worked, I had I had gone and worked, uh, started working at Midway. Tom, this the whole thing is not a a, a, a love story between Tom and I and Howard paths are in a crossing, but at the time, Tom went and started working at Insomnia Games. And he started messing around with, the, he started, uh, I think he was finishing up Spyro. And then he was working on a project that was about this furry little alien creature with a, with a metal robot in his back. Oh, and then he, oh that's my um, favorites. That's Ratchet and Clank, baby. It, exactly, right? It's oh, a, it's, I, could talk, I could talk all, literally till the sun comes up on that series. Well, we're going to talk about Ratchet and Clank. Don't worry. We're getting there. As and you so, guys know, Kevin worked on that movie. I know. Yeah, it's just, it's just weird. It just kind Phenomenal of phenomenal like movie. Your own kind of like Matrix fever dream, where like everything's like sort of oddly connected. But then, so he ended up cre sort of creating that. I'm not sure if we can legally say that or not, but um, so he started doing. It. And, and basically, uh, I think I uh, was no longer employed at the company for one reason or another. And then the company ended up be creating this thing called Ratchet and Clank that both of us ended up working on like 10 years later. It was really weird kind of way. Uh, so anyway, so he went off and did that. I was working at Midway and the whole flying mechanic and the whole race mechanic, it just really wasn't working right with, with the freaky game at all. And that was sort of the one thing. Cause it was like, maybe there was like, was it Diddy Kong? Was that the, the only other sort of flying, yeah. Diddy flying Kong, game? Diddy Kong racing too, Diddy right? racing. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's like a really nice kind of like flying. exploring. Kind of like that was, open. yeah, that was really it. Cause I know there was, um, was it Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge, yeah. and the original Xbox? But that was more combat than a race. Yeah, I know there was a racing yeah, aspect. Crimson Skies is—it's an all-time classic for the Xbox yeah. too. 
Uh, yeah, that was a launch title another, for it, actually. That's another story for another day, but yes, absolute, but yeah. absolute classic. Um, one of my favorite games of all time. Top 25. It's, it's good. No kidding. It's, uh, it's, it, it, was, it was one of those things where as soon as we got everything in, it's almost easier to do a land race basing game because there's so many speed cues. I remember that. And then as soon as we stuck everything in the air, it's just like... Yeah, I'm going a yep. thousand miles an hour, but it just looks like because there's nothing using the vine. How do you, how do you sort of design it and make it work like that? And so it turns out uh, Tom Tanaka was looking for a job at the time, and so he came back and he started working on that. And he was the one like if, if there's anything to really love about how that game was laid out and specifically the sort of how the the, the taste and the gameplay was curated, that yeah. was 100. percent And then it's just funny per our conversation how it kind of links back to Earthworm Jim and all of those aesthetics. I still write. Yeah. Well, you just like mine or you don't. I think there's 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 a certain like regardless of what the medium is, you know, you just yeah. kind of get it or you don't. It, it, it's and you know it's it. You're right. It it does all go back to that. I mean, especially in, in a day and age where everybody hates everything, like everybody complains about everything. Welcome to this this thing called the internet. You you get this thing here. It's called the keyboard, and then you bitch across this with all these different keys and you know every it. it man, it sucks. Like people people rip on uh, an artist direction because they never understood the process. When you see the process from the inside, even just the last 20 years, like I have, like be, being in the game industry or now doing striking out and doing my own thing. And, you know, really seeing how, you know, producers, animators, writers, everybody works and just, it's really hard to shit on someone's work because that's something that, you know, keeps your yeah. lights on, keeps your kids fed, keeps your, your mm -hmm. wife and your bills happy and, and your yeah. bills paid and your wife happy and everything yeah. like that. It's, it, it's, it's really hard to sit here and be like, okay, I played this game. It sucks. You know, if I, if I buy a game and I trade it in at GameStop, I'm just like, Hey, this just what, when they ask, they're like, Oh, you didn't like it. Eh, it just wasn't for me. You know, yep. that, that's really the way I look at it now. I, I try not to be negative about things. Like we, we talked about it yesterday in our pre-call. Like we talk, I forget what movie we talked about, but I was like, yeah, this just really wasn't for me. It wasn't great in my eyes, uh, but yeah, yeah. Yep. you know, and it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to just barrel people. It just, man, that's what sucks about the internet. You've put your heart and soul into this and, you know, I mean, there's other stuff here. There's some fun stuff that, you know, everybody will talk about. I mean, we can talk about, well, scary tales. We can talk about bed bugs, oh, but I mean, we were talking about uh, we we're talking about uh, Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, so I, while we got Kingdom into Hearts, that, yeah. and then we went off that, uh, I started working uh, a lot, uh, just doing a lot of freelancing around uh, animation studios. And basically, if someone would uh, option a comic book, I'd sort of be one of the writers that they would go to and say, "Hey, can you make a Bible out of this and see if there's a show? And if there's a show, maybe we can pay you to write a pilot script, all that kind of stuff." And so it was a lot of. Uh, it was sort of like my lottery ticket years, I guess. It was like a year or two of just constantly like, okay, this is the one that's going to go. And, yep. uh, and you'd, get, you'd get all excited. And sometimes it'd be like a Mickey Mouse uh, preschool show that became whatever Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. But there was 10 oh. of us doing different Mickey Mouse uh, Clubhouse right. shows. Traumatized Kingdom Hearts Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. The, the Mickey's Clubhouse is not, not great. Just, when my kid was about that age when that show came out but yeah kingdom hearts it hits hard. i mean it hits hard. <laughs> are you allowed to talk about what happened like why did this yeah no it was in kingdom hearts was yeah kingdom hearts was like the preschool show that they basically had the money where they just i think they god they must have done i think a good dozen at least i heard more uh versions of it where they would just bring somebody in and just pay them just to write a script and develop a bible and see kind of what uh, what develops and and but at the same time looking back i mean it must have been a rights nightmare i mean like this is this was yeah i mean kingdom hearts is like a melting pot years. of 75 different licenses pardon my and, french and, but it is a bukkake of disney titles exactly right no it and, really and it can, it, it, there was something to it like we just, said people 18 so, plus stream <laughs> bukkake of titles <laughs> blah, 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 blah. i said it ban me go ahead that was the, the third division. There was the boys' department, the girls' department at Disney at the time. And, and everybody the, arguing about who's going to have more screen time and someone demanding that Walt Disney be unfrozen to see this crap. Yeah, so it was, uh, I just, it was basically, we wrote, uh, we wrote and just developed a pilot, never actually shot it or brought it to boards, but uh, wrote it. And it was just a, it was just a standard day in the life. It wasn't like a big old intro, but it was just like a really fun, I mean, I love, I love, I, I said they're coming out with like a new Quantum Leap reboot i i mean yeah. i love that that construct of a show there's another show called voyagers that was like a really obscure sort of i want to say early mid 80s 
and they had this thing called the Omni, and it was like this little brass thing, and it was just this this cool swashbuckling dude from from the past who got swept up with this young kid from from New York, I think, and uh, they just lost in time, and just that stuff was so fun. So that was kind of the inspiration for that. Just never went anywhere. So it went from Kingdom Hearts, and well, we already said it. Kingdom Hearts is one of those things that is just so it's beloved. First of all, I I have. Um, memories of being you know in college and my girlfriend Aaron Donovan at the time uh funny enough who lives down the street from me now um I remember we we one night decided that we were going to go buy Kingdom Hearts 2 because she was like I saw this game and it has Mickey Mouse in it and she was a very big Disney fan and that was my introduction to Kingdom Hearts um but it just it it kind of happened to be something that was special and, and it's amazing. Tron was in it. D- Mickey was in it. Goofy it's, had a damn shield and a sword. It's and one of those games where, like, the franchise, it was just the right thing at the right time. Yeah. Like, if it had There's, come out two years earlier, it would have just, it would have flopped on its face, I think. And then, you know, later on, if it had come out four or five years later, it would have been, like, that, you know, that lightning in a bottle moment for it to come out would have been passed. Yeah. Now, we, now look, we have a fourth one coming out. They announced that randomly a couple months ago. I mean, yeah. and why not? It's just it's completely endless. I mean, it's and in terms of how it's many times you can play too. well. Yeah, it's a confusing it, story. It <laughs> I mean, at 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 a at a time, yeah, it could be. I, I mean, I agree with that. You know, if I mean there's all these side stories that came to it, but you'd think something that was such a juggernaut, something that was so so huge, they they would put a show out for. They would, they would bring, yeah. the, they would bring this to light, especially considering the, f- and, and I'm gonna say this literally, all of Hollywood is owned by three companies. I think that's a, an accurate statement: Nickelodeon and Viacom, um, Disney, and then um, Clear Channel own 90 percent of the crazy shit that goes on in Hollywood. You got Disney literally owns the license to everybody that's in that game, everything, and now they just took on Marvel and Star Wars. Just Imagine what you could have done with that when you brought Kingdom Hearts to light. Imagine what when they brought. This is even more shocking. Is is that they had uh, Disney Infinity because when Amiibos were popular and Disney. Oh Infinity, my god! They, could, yeah. they couldn't get Disney Infinity off the ground. It's yep. it's it's the endless possibilities here. And 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 the reason I wanted to talk about this is is because I'm in utter disdain and shock that this never came to be an animated series like. Like you were saying, we're getting a reboot of Logan's Run. I'm kind of questionable about that. Rumor has it we're getting a reboot of Quantum Leap, too, which I don't know how I feel about either one of those being rebooted. They're timeless 80s classics. They're cheesy. They're fun. They're amazing. Um, and I think now with the uh, you know the current state of you know, series and, and stuff like that with, with yeah. Disney+, Plus specifically, you could do an entire series of, like, what if? involving yeah. the kingdom hearts universe yeah. like what if this happened instead of xyz yeah what if that's what's, 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 what's the didn't get the disney one in? right yeah. what's the disney one that's being hawked right now where you can see bell and i think sully or something it looks like it's an alt like an alt world kind of thing where she's lost oh, in i've heard of that I it keeps on popping up there. i was just yeah i've heard i think it's a that. game like and so it's a game of some sort but and then that's the other thing too is like why does it have to be a series like why can't you then start spinning all this stuff up and instead of taking the stories and then making it a game and then like why can't you just take all of this game it's, content and then either yeah. it's it's unreal what they have too like you you think yeah. about it now they have fox too which now gives them the simpsons yep. you know just just think about everything that disney could do with with a project like that now let's let's play what if kevin monroe had the ability to write and direct this series you know, imagine if this came to fruition in 2004 and, and we're going to we're going to take a minute on this because this is actually this has devolved into something so much greater than I expected. And I'm, I'm so happy about this. And I, I, I'm it's Kingdom Hearts, man. So I can talk about it all day long. That and Final Fantasy seven. Absolutely. All day long. But so let's talk about this. If you had the opportunity to work on such a prestigious franchise like this, and I mean, you've worked on prestigious franchises. So me saying that working on a prestigious franchise is almost an insult, literally. But imagine you have the opportunity to take this franchise and really just it's 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 fourth. And and for my Patriots fans in the audience, I'm going to use this. It's fourth and one. And you're on you're on the one yard line with beast mode. What are you going to do with it? 
Like, where would you, Jesus. where could you have gone with this? Like, I'm going to put you on the spot here. And no, just, dude, I mean, it's really interesting. Like, it's one of those, like, and I'll do a total mea culpa on it. Like, I probably didn't have the chops to take it on. Like, I, I did not have the chops to take it on at the time. And I don't think that's really not the reason why it would have, it didn't get picked up. But looking back, I mean, like, I really sit back and I think about, like, well, how did I build? It's funny, I've got this favorite quote, and, and it's attributed to George Lucas, but I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't want to quote it as such, but like I, I love this quote of just saying, making movies uh, is easy. Uh, finding out what to make movies about is very, very hard. And there's something that I found as time goes on, as time has gone on, that I, uh, that it just, it's, it's a weird thing. It just becomes truer and truer. And so what's really great is that as a, and I'm not doing this just to cop out and not answer the question. It would have been big. It would have been awesome. It would have been all the cool things that, you know, we want it to be, but like it's looking back at it, I'd love to have a crack at it now because it would have been a completely different thing than what it would have been obvious if I would have taken it on because I didn't really know what it was about. And so even now, like even when I'll take on something that's just like silly or small or, or obscure or whatever it is it still sort of has to be about something it seems like so um so that's and i didn't really know what it, what kingdom hearts would have been about back then that's really funny it would have been about the license i was really caught up in like being able to put something like that on the big screen which probably led to turtles at some point uh, right on. That, which is probably one of the first times where i realized that a, a story had to be about something and then that's oh. probably when i first started. I, embracing I, that. I think as creators, we've all gotten to that point. I, I, I haven't really talked about this in a while, but uh, there's a comic book I've been working on called Canton um, that unfortunately I've decided to shelf for the time being because I'm at a point, I'm at an impasse with the publisher and I'm also at an impasse. Where do I want to go next with it? So I've kind of yeah. just put it off to the side and heavily focused on this, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you one more question out of that and we're going to move on and we'll, we'll talk about sure. finger Lake yeah. since that's a wild okay. pop culture success like that, yeah. that needs to be discussed. I mean, as, as the fact that knowing a lot of the people in this chat are parents and aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces and all that good shit. If you had to pick knowing what you know about kingdom hearts now, 16 years later, yeah. um, or yeah. no, 18 years, excuse me. Um, nah. If, is there one Disney property that you would put into that game that's not in there and why? Um, okay, this is going to back into my what I think would be my go to Disney pitch if I had it. And I'm not sure if they're in um, if they're in uh, if they're in the game or not. But are there rescuers in, in Kingdom Hearts? Chip and Dale? The mice? No, the the the, uh, the rescuers, the Bianca and the, the, the mice. The, so I would love, I think personally that an actual full on Stuart Little, but way more animated version of remake of the rescuers at Disney would just be fucking bomb. I think that okay. that's just like a money yeah. printing machine. And so I, I would love to put those characters inside. I'd love to see that world from a different vantage point and seeing it from that world down there would be you really kind of cool. And, and that can attest to anything. Like imagine if Bambi would like, you could go, what if with anything, like what if Bambi's mom didn't die? What if, or the what if, what, yeah, yeah. What if, five, what if Fievel didn't go on an American tale? You know what I mean? Rescuers, <laughs> solid, solid out of left field choice. We call this show a charcuterie board of fuckery for a good reason. And you literally just, you literally just rocked me with that one. That was a great, 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 um, great, uh, call. I mean, I'm personally a Hanna-Barbera fan. I, w I would love to see a crossover between Secret Squirrel, uh, Adamant, and, uh, Birdman or even space ghost in between all that. But um, it's, it's one of those things where there's just, there's so much we could, we could, you know, we could go off into and it's, oh man, good question. There's I, a, uh, there was, there was a while for that one. <laughs> in, I think it was the late nineties, maybe early two thousands. Hanna Barbera was like open to any pitch whatsoever. And it was just basically, here's our catalog. We're open to it all. And I think I did, I think I did a captain caveman private eye pitch. What? And I can't remember. We did another one. Yeah. And it was just like, they're just like these one offs. You go in and it's a 15 minute pitch and whatever. Right. Wait, but wait, it was like, it was really fun. And so like every now and again, pitch. give us, uh, hold on. I, I, do, I can't, I can't even remember. No, I'm not even going to remember it. I can't remember. There's so many Holy of them. Holy shit. I, have never I, seen I love Billy Captain Caveman. What the fuck? Well, Captain Caveman. Yeah. You, you can't, Captain Caveman and Jabber Jaws. I would do oh, Jabber Jaws in our I, I love Jabber Jaw too. You have to understand something. There is a whole shelf in my office that includes a CN watch from the original Flintstones toys. <laughs> I am a I am a fucking nerd for 
Like, above everything else in this room, all this beautiful stuff. Zartan, fucking Secret Squirrel, Space Ghost, Space Ghost Coast to Coast, The Brack Show, Captain Caveman, Chapperjaw, all that. Like, it's, like, my whole... Fuck, the GoBots I'm were Hanna-Barbera. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. it, that, just, that just went all over the place, and I love it. Guys, one thing I'm, I apologize, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show, um, we're going to suspend channel points, and uh, we're going to have an AMA with Kevin at the end of this. So any questions you guys have, we're going to let you throw in chat when we're done with this part, and let Kevin answer any of your questions, and this is going to be fun. I promise you Kevin will also be back because I know you're all having a blast in here, because literally our, count, our, our viewer count hasn't dropped, which is huge. So, <laughs> moving on. There was bed bugs and spy kids and Damn, man, you've been everywhere. And, and then and the big the one. the most, the most badass uh, My Little Pony poster I have ever seen yeah. in my life. 2007's no, My Little it. Pony. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, no. I mean, dude, this is this is a career that most people would go bananas for. And yes, we're, we're skipping ahead of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because we're going to save the best for last. We're going to make you guys salivate <laughs> for it. We're going to make you guys think about it because, look, I, I, I have some things in my phone that... that pff, I, I didn't even want to look at before the show went live because even I want to be even I want to be excited and shocked when Kevin talks about these things. I have the original script for Kevin's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sitting on my phone. And, you know, just just uh, for for discussion sake here, like literally it's right here. And it's it's one of those things that you'd think a crazy son of a bitch like me would read before this episode but i i wanted to be shocked i wanted to be surprised i wanted to hear it directly from kevin's mouth i've been waiting months for this so when we get to it we will get to it i'm surprised um, you didn't read that with your morning cup of coffee well i got it this afternoon <laughs> like the new york so I times I, I wouldn't i wouldn't need it needed three hours to read 98 pages and like seven cups of coffee and i probably wouldn't sleep tonight i don't think i'm gonna anyway but Let's talk about fingerlings because fingerlings is a huge piece of childhood pop culture from the the mid to, the mid to late two thousands and 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 beyond. Like it's become such a thing. Like it's what Furbies were to those of us who were Gen X and early millennial. You know how did that all come about? Wowie Toys is a huge deal, huge huge deal. Like yeah, no, it was crazy. The um, I think it was one of these things where it was twenty. I think it's twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, uh, whatever it was. They were. Uh, I think they all of a sudden found themselves saddled with the toy of the year. And it was, and it's just this really fun. I don't have any here, but um, it's just this really fun little handheld thing you put on your finger and it responds to voice and being upside down. And it's like, it's a, it's what you would call a very charming interactive toy. Right. Yeah, and it's, absolutely. and it's in that really cool. Wow. We, that sort of wowy sweet spot of, we give you this kind of fun electronics for under what, 10, 15 bucks or whatever it was. Yeah. So it's, it's well, totally priced, reasonable. every parent wanted it. They were going crazy on the aftermarket. Blew yep. off the shelves apparently. And so it was really crazy. And then, uh, so uh, we had a common friend uh, in this uh, uh, incredible guy I know called uh, Russell Binder, who was my uh, first manager when I first uh, started out. And then, but he's also, he may, or he works uh, in licensing now mainly and, 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 expanding out to everything he's doing and uh and so uh that was sort of our common friend and apparently they had this this big hit and and there wasn't really a, a lot of they had my little pony on their hands without really the my little pony show or, or the my little pony story so basically i just kind of went in there and jammed with them and, and we created this really fun story and uh and we animated 30 minutes of of cg shorts with this incredible animation studio out of montreal or out of quebec in canada called uh squeeze animation uh we did 30 minutes of that little like little minute and a half things and then we did this crazy uh puppet sort of a saturday night live but like with these little uh like fingerling shows where uh with these little fingerling puppets where you would just see the hands and had this incredible sort of homemade feel put them up on youtube and they were sort of for marketing but at the same time it was sort of a backdoor pitch for an actual show and uh and son of a gun i mean i think like all of them now have like they're nearing close 100 million views total i think for the yeah. entire uh the entire catalog and it's just one of those things where just people just kept coming back for it and it the show never got picked up show never got made we got we got it i think on crave in canada uh but it it reigns supreme on youtube and i was gonna say cool. that's wild it never got picked up yeah. last i saw the other day the the full animated video 43 million i think views. it's 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 sitting at almost 50 million <laughs> that was just one. that's <laughs> that's wild yeah. but that didn't yeah. get picked up that's no, it's crazy. And that entire crew is like that's that's a whole Quebec production. I mean, that's oh, a lot yeah. of it. It's just like one. It's one studio. It's all local actors, really super talented actors up there. And uh, 
yeah, it was great. Just like, it was just, it was, it was such a great example of just how simple it can be to make something. And it was a really great example because it was outside of the bullshit of what the actual industry is, right? Like it, a lot of those layers, but still that, that bullshit still comes in when it comes time to the deal. And can you actually make a business deal that makes sense to put a series on the air? Cause it's not just a matter of, Hey, we like it. Let's put it on. There's a lot of paperwork, right? So, yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it just kind of happens sometimes. So, but we'll always have you too. Well, it's, yeah. it's absolute madness how much the landscape has changed since, well, for me, 1982, you know, you, you look at, you look at the way things were when, you know, as Chris likes to say, I was at the midnight release of fire. Um, it's true. <laughs> he was the water boy. I was, I was, um, but it's, Apple it's, fire. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you look at and you see how far we've come and, and, and how much traditional media has changed. Like, as somebody who went to school for radio 10 seconds after I got out of school, like, radio is right. dead. Radio is fucking yeah, no, dead. Exactly. Yep. And, I, and I, I looked myself in the mirror and I went, well, fuck, what am I going to do now? And then I got into journalism and, well, fuck, what am I going to do now? I yep. mean, I've I've said more times in my life, "fuck," what am I going to do now than I than I have? Hey, I finally found it. I, I think I finally found it with this, but we'll see if I say, "fuck," what am I going to do now when this all falls apart and we all decide, "well, what are we going to do? Are we going to scramble or we're going to make this work?" And we and we make this work, and well, "fuck," what are we going to do now? But um, anyway, that's yeah, the punchline, right? That is that what is I'm, the punchline. What am I going to do now? I have a ta- I'm going to get a tattooed on me somewhere. But exactly. the thing about it is, is like traditional media has changed. Like you, you look back in the day, yeah. and everybody was trying to copy everybody. Late eighties, everybody was trying to copy Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Everybody was trying to copy Captain Planet. Toxic Crusaders, probably one of my favorite things in the entire world. Perfect example of that. We're going to talk about them because I meant to say something about that to you uh, on our call yesterday, but I, I completely missed it. Uh, but everything was cable. When we were kids, okay? Everything was three, five, and seven, then cable, okay? Yep. And cable, with the with the invention of DVR, became different. You didn't have to live on TV schedule. Then YouTube came along. And YouTube changed the game because a lot of those things that you're looking for, you can find on a, on a portable platform that you now have. Literally, everything's here now anyway. But mm. the point is, is that everything has changed and evolved. And it's a consumer market now. Like, kids are smart. And every parent in the universe has given their kid a YouTube account. Let's be, let's be realistic. I, I've had many times where I've seen my niece, Small's daughter, watching YouTube videos, or my daughter, even at 17, watching countless YouTube videos. Everything's there. It could be something as simple as our podcast. It could be something as, as, as devolved as a, a crime drama that someone produced and put on their on their YouTube channel. Uh, back to, to Halloween Ends, we were talking about earlier in the show. Uh, the trailer is supposed to drop this week. There's been five fan films that went along with it. Fan, fan-made trailers, fan-made theories. Everything is there. You can, you can become a QAnon theorist, figure out what action figures you like, and see a trailer for a movie you like all on YouTube. I wouldn't recommend the first one, but the other two I would highly recommend. It, and two of them would just be long form ads. And it's it's <laughs> exactly, and it's just it's amazing to think what is out there, and yeah. and what it how how as Stives likes to say, our our co owner, um, content snackable content is a big deal, yeah. and it's it's just amazing to see how it's changed and you know like projects like this like chris said almost 50 million views uh the video we were looking at yesterday 43 million views how does it feel to have one of the most well-known youtube videos of all time it's amazing it doesn't feel like yeah it doesn't feel like anything it's really weird because it just kind (laughs) of happens like what's really fun at the beginning and that's a whole new thing because it's kind of like you have the charge whenever like a movie comes out and you're kind of like watching the box office and you get those updates on the hour and then sometimes it goes like really you're like oh i really yep. didn't want that update. and then sometimes it's like holy shit look at that mm. and uh and so with this specifically for the first few it was really great and I specifically i remember like whenever we hit a million we were all kind of like wow that's actually kind of cool and there's of course there's the boosts and it's all the business of putting video you guys know this well it's all the video the business of putting videos on youtube right like and so it's it's all the metrics of see here on the graph this is where everyone tunes out so therefore yep. 
that's what we don't need in here. And so all of a sudden, that's why everything that's on YouTube is always like this. And you're just like, oh, yeah, geez. it's all like, it's all ADHD down. content. Yeah. And so it's really crazy. And, and so it's, and so it's fun to try to figure out how to get a story in like that. But at the same time, you realize we just go through a lot of really bad ideas to get to where we really want to be. And some parts of that are just uh, I like I like the 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 efficiency of story the like like get to the point and mm -hmm. and don't 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 tease us let's just get to it um at the same time it's just interesting like kind of figuring out what it was the tail and what's the dog on on a lot of that stuff so that yeah. was it was a crazy experience going through it so. well it's it, it's Great amazing learning. and i i know that's not something our our chat would regularly discuss as a interesting topic but when when you're talking when you're talking to an accredited filmmaker and someone who's worked on such wild projects like off the wall projects let's just be honest like looking at your resume some of the stuff we can't even talk about is just it's it's oh, fuck it a eh, man it's it's like there's just so much stuff in here that i wish came to fun. fruition and was yeah. yep. something that we all got a chance to see like am i allowed yep. to talk about a certain project from um blockade entertainment uh which one heavenly sword yeah no i mean heavenly sword happened which is crazy yeah, yeah no which, heavenly sword was i wish there yeah. was more i wish there was more yeah i know is that is such a rich world it's got a beautiful look uh, Amazing just female. everything about it. It was just a fantastic yeah. world. And so the premise that, that Brad Foxhoven and the guys at Blockade came basically started, and this was even before we did that. I want to say it was like even years before that Brad had first talked to me about it. And he was, he is such an early pioneer. Sometimes you're so far ahead of the wave, you just get crashed by it. And that, that sort of is one of those situations there, I think, because it, it he was so sort of on it right from the beginning and and one of uh, one of the first things we did was heavenly sword as a way to test the idea that you could take an existing game take the assets port them over into new cg productions and tell new stories i want to say that the first one that was discussed it might have been it wasn't call of duty it was another world war ii when i was out at the time Battle 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 of Honor. Honor. medal of honor thank you it was medal yes. of honor and so it was uh hey how cool would it be if we took medal of honor went to a history channel, did like a 10 part series. And again, mind you, this was 10 years before the idea of streaming limited series and all this other stuff. Right? I was going to say, that's kind of where band of brothers kind of came to be. Wasn't it? Totally. Solid yeah. show too. Solid show. And that, and that was, that was, that was the template for it. And so, Hey, could you do that? And so heavenly sword was sort of the test pilot where there was like a Korean studio uh, that we found there's a really great director that was there and we had three million dollars for it it was meant to be direct to dvd it was meant to sort of test the pipeline and it was great because it it proved the point and that was the thing that led to everything that could happen with ratchet what was attempted with sly and all that stuff um but at the same time it also showed that it's it's really challenging to port you just can't take assets from one studio and put them in another studio everyone yeah. sort of it's just like relationships. It's like it's too sticky. You just can't just do a swap right away. And just There's like, too much history this there. Is my exactly. new partner. It's, yeah, it's a little hard. So, so uh, kind of like yeah. those days that Chris just wants to get rid of me and swap partners. I'm not saying it can't Hello, be done, Paul, but it's, 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 a lot, it's a lot stickier than you think. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot more for sure it is. It, it's... <laughs> oh, wow. Me just... Bruh. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, one of those things where, you know, it, it, it sounds like a fucking nightmare just waiting to happen, but it's like chat. I'm sure you can attest to this. Everybody who's here, who's played it. Heavenly sword is a fantastic game. It would have been cool to see more of heavenly sword. And I mean, yeah, there's projects, man, th th this whole resume, just looking at it. Lucasfilm is on here. Blockade Fox yeah. studios. Platinum Studios, you know, just and and Gatcha Man's on there. I'm a big Gatcha Man fan, so yeah, that, that for me, that's there's really a couple. Yeah, there's a couple are sort of like the one who got away, and I hate thinking like that because it's such a horrible way to live your life, friend. Uh, but I will tell you that there's there's probably one that got away, and the one that got away is Gatcha Man. It's it's just it will always be, and there's almost something like super romantic about it, right? Like it's like really good to have, sort of have one that you go, I just don't want to let that happen again. And uh, it was uh, it was just like a really funny thing, like we because we come off Turtles, and Turtles was already doing really well. Warner Brothers was happy. Uh, uh, Warner Brothers really kind of took the lead on that one, and uh, and we just had a meeting uh, about it uh, with Jeff Robinoff, who was the head of uh, Warner's at the time, 
and he we were 10 minutes into the pitch and uh and so what i what happened with it is that uh, as turtles was wrapping up francis cow the guy who was sort of the the owner and the head guy at the at Amaji, uh just called me up and he was like what would you like to do and, and i said uh i would love to do a battle of the planets movie and uh because i grew up with it as battle of the planets in canada and even before star wars it was probably the first thing that i probably role played that I, I would put on a hockey helmet and i would put on a trash bag on, yeah. around my neck you know, a cape. <laughs> my, and i was i was, man, I was I like gee, well. i was you know, it was I, so good and yeah you know, i remember when it yeah. was on uh do you remember when it was on cartoon network in the 90s no, I remember when it was on my TV in the 70s. So that's, that's, I wasn't there for that. Sorry, I, I didn't show up till 82, but I was and it was fucking awesome. The it 70s so were good. amazing from what everybody tells me. They had this thing called LSD that everybody used to take. Yeah. I don't I don't know what it is, but, it was, you know, yeah, whatever. Kindergarten was wild for me in the 70s. It was great. I, I can I can imagine, you know, with things like Gotcha Man, especially when it came back and it was in the States and it was called G-Force. I, I'll never forget it because yeah. it was like. As Smalls called it yesterday, <coughs> he called it um, Speed Racer with Wings. Uh, I, I just, I remember the opening line and it was G-Force. It was just so good. And I, I used to get dragged to work with my dad and my Uncle Larry when uh, I was a kid. My my Uncle Larry owns uh, Colonial Automotive Group out here in Massachusetts. And uh, I used to have to Are we going to stop wing. and like at least have a logo come up for that? <laughs> no, I, mean, I didn't get paid for that. So he ain't getting a logo. So Sorry, you gotta, like, point to it or something. <laughs> Listen, no, no, no freebies around here. Bruh. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, now, I, I remember having to used to sit in the waiting room on Sundays after cleaning the lot because my dad would give me my allowance for the week cleaning the lot, my stepdad. Nice. And uh, G-Force would always be on. And um, I, I, I used to watch it in, in, incessantly, just obsessed because I was so into Silverhawks. No matter what you say, Silverhawks is better than Thundercats. And you can fight me on that one. Meet me in the comments. They're right there. <laughs> um, anyway, but the point is, is that it was one of those things that I really just got into and I, I loved. And it's, it's all because yeah. of that. I remember my uncle Larry walks in one day, he goes, Oh, what are you watching kid? I'm like, Oh, this is G force. And he goes, Oh, you mean ba uh, war of the War the battle of the worlds. And I was like, what? Battle I don't know what this is. <laughs> and it just, it opened up a whole new door for me. And, I'm not really the biggest anime fan. Um, I'm 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 into Dragon Ball up to a certain point, like past Z. I don't know anything. I sure. I loved Trigun. I loved um, Exo Squad. I loved Centurions. I loved stuff like that. And yeah. um, G Force was that that gateway drug for that, and that was yeah. just fantastic. And it was right. one of those things that I. You know, my poor wife, God bless her, you know, having to deal with my, my pop culture obsession. You know, it's it's one of those things. I'm, I'm sure she's sitting upstairs watching this right now and thinking to myself, God damn it, another fucking hobby for him. <laughs> you know, and it was just it was that gateway. So, like, when you say that's the one that got away, like, I, it, mm -hmm. it, it breaks my heart that you're saying that. Like, I feel I feel very strongly about Halloween and how Michael Myers should have been gone after the second movie. Uh, don't get me wrong. I've loved every sequel that has been Halloween, even the trash ones. But the fact of the matter is the season of the witch is my favorite Halloween movie of all time. I talk about it romantically, very romantically. I talk about that movie and my obsession. It's kind of a it. problem at all. Honestly. Like, third one. We, is that what we, we actually, yes. The third one with uh, Tom Atkins. Dude, I love the third, the third. Hey. I obsessed it. Like that hit, that hit on home video at such a good time for me. Mm. And that it just so rocked my world that like I watched and, that over and over again. An, an amazing movie, but in in my eyes, the anthology that John Carpenter and Deborah Hill had planned and were pushing is the one that got away from me. I, I mean, I, I somehow would have worked on it someday. I hope that was a dream. You know, it's still a dream of mine to be butchered in in a in a horror movie or go down swinging or go down fucking in a horror movie. You know, it's just something that I've always wanted to do. But I, I just, you know, I, I, I understand that sentiment because I really wanted a different path for Halloween and I never got it. But yeah. moving on, Sly, you've already said it, Sly Cooper. Sly Cooper <laughs> was, was great and, and Sly Cooper led to other things. Now, from Sly Cooper came Ratchet and Clank. And Ratchet and Clank was a major motion picture, as we all know. For those of us who've seen it, we know it's a really fun movie. It it was my foray into the game. Let's talk. Really? About 
Yeah. That's cool. That Okay. I saw that movie. I, I went to a movie theater, and this is a really funny story. For those of you who don't know, I am eight days away from eight years of sobriety. Um, but nice. uh, I, I got drunk, and I had tickets to another movie. I forget what the movie was. I think it was a Marvel movie, and I walked in, and I ended up watching Ratchet and Clank because I walked Dude, in. Dude, half my theater. residuals come from people being drunk or stoned and seeing my stuff by accident. <laughs> Keep well, I'm glad I can put some money in your pocket, pal. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Anyway, let's talk. Let's oh, talk man. about Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, Ratchet. I mean, that was uh, that was crazy. So yeah, it, it kind of that was the how the progression of all the, the blockade stuff went. It went from Heavenly Sword, and then and there was all there's always been there'd always been sort of a. a a sort of a tumbleweed of a dozen projects that could go that were sort of in that Sony library. And, and that was sort of how it was sort of shaking out. That was going to be kind of a Sony affiliation in that way. And, uh, and so Ratchet got announced and then they started development of that up at Rainmaker. And then, and then Sly Cooper was announced and that was the one that I was uh, going to really jump on. And I was like, I was really into Sly. And, uh, and so at the time uh, I wrote uh, the, the trailer, the teaser trailer, we directed it up at, uh, at, at Rainmaker and, uh, and uh, I wrote a script and, and it just didn't go anywhere from that. It just really kind of, and I think what it was is when it, what was happening is when that was going on, the ratchet movie was sort of in the middle of a year of ramping up and trying to find how it was going to find its way into production. And I think it was an awful lot for a new studio and a new sort of production kind of entity to be trying to get a first movie up and going and also figuring out future development, even though Brad and I like we totally saw it as like a five year plan and we knew how it was going. I think it's really hard like within a machine to kind of do that. So so it was decided just to kind of pause on it, which ended up being an indefinite pause that is still existing to this day since 2013. Uh, and then uh, and then the focus was on uh, Ratchet and Clank. And then I was asked to come in and, uh, uh, and uh, help direct uh, Ratchet and Clank with about, I think it was, 13 or 14 months left i think i want to say with it and it was basically just uh hit the ground and let's get it done so given the timeline that you just said 13 14 months that sounds like just knowing what i know about the movie industry from some of the people yeah. i've dated some of the people i'm friends with um that sounds like a fucking nightmare timeline can you talk about that timeline like what had to be done to make this happen because ratchet and clank was an excellent movie like the fact that you came in so late in the production of this and made this such a hit. Yeah, is... yeah that wasn't a ground up 13, 14 months. There was a lot of stuff. Basically, it was 13, 14 months after probably a lot of the, the most of the digital back lot was basically built and your cast was already kind of there. Uh, they were still in the middle of like kind of cleaning up some things and, and, and figuring out a couple of last remaining like sort of designs. So it wasn't necessarily a design thing. It's it's. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's it's the same with all of these projects. It's it's if you just don't have a plan, it just goes off the rails so quickly. But if you have one, you can really go in and you can be aggressive and you can you can hit a timeline like that if you have a solid plan. If you're trying to figure out stuff and you're trying to put, you know, the track in front of the train like Wallace and Gromit or whatever, and like as it's barreling down the track and you're just trying to like figure out shit right before it's due. That's when things really start to get hinky. And a lot of the times, especially with, uh, with independent productions like that, that just don't have that infrastructure. Like Disney's invested in making sure that when they make a movie, it just like, it's going to go to the end and it's going to, and they have the money and they have the investment yeah. that Pixar has it, Illumination has that, but all these other ones, are, all these other sort of independent projects are dependent upon another entity creating that sense of urgency and you know schedule and stuff like that so it's uh so it's it's always uh, that that's usually where it kind of falls apart but it's it's totally doable if, if you have a plan so so when, nightmares are fun sometimes, with, I guess. with I that know. plan in place was there were there rewrites reshoots that had i mean it's animation so reshoots are just redraws i would assume yeah. but was there stuff that had to be redone at that point uh right at the beginning yeah i mean uh it's in every you know every movie's different even though it all seems like it comes down to the same four problems all the time or the same four challenges uh but uh sometimes uh with this one specifically that it was it was just like a, there was a lot that was happening in the movie and there's a lot that was happening in the movie that took a lot of time to sort of put on screen and so as a result it needed to be really trimmed down i think that was it there's probably like a movie and a half in there and, and it was all fantastic but at the end of the day, it needed to fit into whatever that, whatever the stupid eighty-eight minute window is that they just love to put animated films in because yep. I mean, that's you can squeeze movie. in one more show a day or something, and it's such a stupid, like antiquated 
uh theatrical rule like the idea like like who gives a shit how long something is on netflix now i get that like you want it not to be like lawrence of arabia for your four-year-old but you know but just the idea no, thank you, you. Know. never again never yeah, again exactly. yeah. just the once that's it you know, just that one them. time that 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 <laughs> one time in college i was naked on a beach in cancun and i had to watch it not that i've ever been to cancun i just was there somehow but it was, it was but, either ratchet or clank or Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, and but Ratchet, was, Ratchet and Clank, I, I, I remember being like half in the back and just being, man, this is fucking fun. And I went out and bought the game a couple days it's, later. It's and, the fun movie. It's no, I, I like. Yeah. I think it's a lot of fun. And, and that crew just really busted their ass on it and really made it happen too. And there's, um, there's still, uh, the biggest challenge with that especially was that the core group that it was, that it was sort of made for in, in that sort of that that ratchet group they got the well smalls knows it because you, you the game released a week before the movie came out, yep. came out, came out like, yeah it was a week or so maybe even like like four or five 50 days minutes of animation or something. Yeah. yeah and i remember when the game came out everyone thought it was going to be like a new sequel to ratchet and clank because it's had you know the original going commando up your arsenal yeah. for you know all for one and they thought it was gonna be a sequel, but it was a it was a redoing, you know, a reboot, so yeah. to speak, based off of the movie. And I'm not gonna lie, when I first heard that, I was a little bit bummed. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Movie games but always get a bum rap, dude. At the same time, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna buy it. I grew up with the series between that and Jack and Daxter. Like I have dude, Jack is so fun. That was always the third one that we always talked about. Uh, dude, to I have been I have legitimately dreamt in written up half scripts of a jack four or even just redoing it or a, a netflix series Good, or man. like a paramount plus animation oh yes <laughs> but i re like there's just so much you could do with the ratchet and clank franchise be it you could do an entire series on just clank and you know him coming out of the factory as a defect so to speak and that whole backstory because yeah. he's got a whole you know plethora of storyline to himself or any of the any of the lore behind the enemies or the worlds themselves, like in um, what was it? The one on PS4, PS3. Ooh. Uh, yeah, what was it? I'm going brain dead because I've played. Like, I'm completely three Ratchet and blanking Clanks. on it. I I have a rift apart sitting on the other side of the room, but the quarry came in from Supermassive, and well, pfft, binky bonky, you everything need, went out. You the need to play Rift Apart. That game is stunning. I, I I've played a little bit of it, but uh, oh, every time I go so to play good. it, um, Dark Pictures Anthology comes out with a new game or another Resident Evil. I buy seven copies of and then put on the Simpsons bowling machine. Um, I'm a, I'm actually downloading Men of Madon right now to the the NBA Jam machine here in the office because you know I'm just I'm literally that obsessed with Supermassive after replaying Until Dawn and then replay and then playing through the quarry like every time i go to play it something gets in the way i can't even talk about you buying all those copies of resident evil because i am the same exact way with anything involving doom <laughs> I am but the you same ripped way. into me about it earlier don't i know i i'm required to i have to buy if i have a quota that i have to hit daily <laughs> of, of of being angry with me yes otherwise okay. the feds come busting through my door <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on, guys. We're going to take just a quick five-minute break here. Everybody get up, stretch your legs, get a soda, because we're going to get into TMNT 07 when we get back and a little more of Kevin's career. And then we're going to open it up to you guys to ask questions so put your channel points away fuck your channel points tonight it's all about talking to kevin and guys don't forget if you're donating bits subs anything tonight 22 percent of those are going to go to our good friends at the colon cancer foundation over in white plains new york in kevin's name so make sure to donate freely and frequently because listen colon cancer sucks but we'll talk about that later we'll be right back after these messages <laughs>
They let us back on the air. We're not banned yet? Somehow. Harvey Weinstein didn't call from jail and get us thrown off the air because Kevin Monroe is here. Anyway, guys, <laughs> welcome back to the brand show. <laughs> <laughs> well, they gave him a call, maybe. But hey, guys, welcome back to the brand show. It's your boy. It's your boy. And it's our boy. <laughs> <laughs> guys, this the show boy. has been the, the guy himself, Kevin Monroe, guys. Listen, this show so far has been really absolutely phenomenal. I want to thank you guys for tuning in if you're here. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in late, don't worry if you missed anything. This will be available to subs and non-subs this week only on Twitch. Uh, the episode will also be available on our YouTube channel on Thursday. If you hit Bassett, do me a favor, hit exclamation socials um, so they can see our socials. <clears throat> um Guys, follow us on Twitch, follow us on YouTube, follow us over on TikTok at a bunch of nerds, Instagram at a bunch of nerds underscore. You can follow me at Billy Nichols Brand, Chris at Chris Small Brand, and Kevin at Kevin Monroe. Make sure to tell him how much you enjoyed this episode and ask him lots of fun questions. We're gonna get to that point. Oh, I'm sorry, is it so? Is, but, blah, 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 bass, take a shot. Uh, Smalls, is it social or socials? Ah, uh, we may have to re-enable that. I do not know. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury and Twitch, go to youtube.com slash a bunch of nerds to see the VOD if you missed the live video. And if not, then, well, you're just super late. Come check us next day. I fucked up my own pitch. <laughs> Take Your a shot. Really. <laughs> well, guys, anyway, uh, just to remind you, tonight's episode is brought to you by Extreme Sets, where you can use code the brand and save 15% at extreme-sets.com and get your own pop-up displays for your figure photography we got one to give away i'll be announcing that in the next week also guys don't forget to check out our other sponsors miracle fruit oil where you can use code billy that's going to change i promise you and save ten dollars on your purchase at miraclefruitoil.com anyway let's get back into it kevin's here kevin monroe ladies and gentlemen we gave him a cheer that nobody could hear it from me Anyway, so moving on, let, let, let's get to the let's get to the main event. But before we get to the main event, let me let me bring in my good friend Michael Buffer for this part. It's now time for the main event. <laughs> oh, that's always fun to do. I love doing that. It's just fun to be a just fun to be klutzy and funny. Anyway. So, he is a live on the other line is Harvey Weinstein. Oh God! Let's bring guys. We ball. have we have a caller live from the LA <laughs> County Jail. Rumble. I don't know how we got my number, but we have a caller. <laughs> uh, you know what? I wouldn't be shocked if I got a cease and desist from Warner Brothers just for this part. And you know what? I'd be fucking proud if I did. So, anyway, with with that being with that being said, I I would be very impressed. Um, but. Let's let's get right into it. There's a project that needs to be discussed because everybody wants to know about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 07. Now, guys, I called it a cult classic earlier in this show. And the reason I called it a cult classic is, is because most of you guys hated it when you were kids because you were like, we should have. And then you were crying about it. I mean, OK, Orokosaki rules. Let's just be honest. Shout out to Shredder. Amazing. Amazing. He was based off a cheese grater. That was in a sink in Derry, New Hampshire. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the movie that Kevin wrote was fantastic. I don't care what you say. It was cool to see a different villain. It was cool to see such a, a wildly talented voice cast. If you don't know, Nolan North is in this movie. Chris Evans is in this movie. Sarah Michelle Gellar is in this movie. Fucking, oh God, I forget his name every time. Patrick Stewart is in this movie. Like, there are just so many amazing people in this movie. Kevin can sprawl off more. Billy West is in this movie. You guys know how much we love Billy West. John DiMaggio's in this movie. Bender's in this movie. How can a movie be bad if Bender's in it? Kevin Michael Richardson. Kevin Michael Mitch, Richardson's in it, too. Mitch Woodfield, Mikey Kelly. God, James Arnold Taylor. Did we already say James? Uh, so Jess Harnell's in it. I mean, like, there's a, like, there's so many people pop up. It's, it is just a who's who of that voice talent so community. For for those folks who haven't seen this movie, let let's talk about your vi Let's talk about the synopsis. Let's talk about the story. Let's guys. I highly recommend you go out and check this. It's going to cost you seven bucks for the Blu-ray on Amazon. It's it's worth your time if you haven't. I, I'll I'll just tell you the one part about it that that matters to a lot of people. Shredder dies. Okay, Shredder's dead. Over. Gone. Goodbye. Fell in a trash can. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye, Shredder. Da da. Anyway, but our villain in this movie is over 3,000 years old and is actually rather interesting, but you don't want to hear it from me. You want to hear it from the man himself. So, Kevin, 
please enlighten them. <laughs> the floor is yours, my friend. Where do we start? Uh, uh, that's funny. Uh, I so yeah, story wise, uh, story. It was really interesting. We came into it. Uh, oh my god, how do you talk about this? Um, there's there's so However much. You want. <laughs> it's, You're not it's, under yeah. NDA anymore. Don't worry. Well, just yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll just uh, we'll just take it to- like just go by a topic. So there's this topic, for instance, the story. That's a good. That's a good end. Um, Developing the story, the idea was uh, there was uh, Peter Laird uh, really wanted to do something that felt new and different. Peter, who was in control of the Turtles franchise at the time, uh, Kevin wasn't uh, involved. And Peter had just finished doing the Four Kids series. Do you remember that? The one and basically was the animated version of if you wrote the comic book, this yep. is the animated series. Now, this want. was so- this was right after Kevin sold his rights to the book. And yeah. to the property and the property brought in Peter. Peter made, if I remember, it was in, in Kevin's voice, $60 million. Um, and this was when Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon took over and acquired the rights and began their foray into, honestly, what I think has become really fun. And, you know, I, I, I really look forward to the new rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think they've done a fantastic job with the project. Um, but yeah, around that time. Yes. I remember four kids though. Yeah, no. So they were, so, so Peter, I think coming off of that as the co-creator of turtles, I think he felt like he kind of like, imagine you wrote all those comic books and you made, wrote these major sort of arcs. And then now you get to do a series of it where you got to kind of expand it out and make it cleaner and do all those things. Like what you don't want to go back and do like, <laughs> okay, it's sort of a spinoff of the daredevil origin and these little tiny turtles get exposed to this. What you know, like you just don't want to go back to that. Oh, and so daredevil I think he was all through that story. That story is. Yeah. I mean, it, it starts as a rip, right. And it just became its own thing. It's, it's one of the greatest. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, and so it was one of these things where I think at the time, looking back, he wanted to go into new territories and along came this ability to do this uh, feature film. Cause there was this young upstart company uh, that was based out of uh, Hong Kong and LA that really wanted the rights when nobody really wanted the rights when this was a, a world where Christopher Nolan was barely starting to work on Batman Begins just to put it in context of uh, of, of where we were in sort of comic book culture and comic book movies because I'll tell you we went out and we tried to sell this to every studio before we had any test trailers or anything and everybody turned it down nobody well Turtles it. was kind of a stale property at the time um, it, yeah, I felt yeah. it right. Like it just sort of like it had that, and and the four kids thing. Like they made, I I I think it's safe to say they made a lot off the four kids. Like just between the merchandising and everything oh, else, yeah. like that was a joke. Yeah, right? wildly popular. And, yeah, and so then back to the story. Then I think like when it came to the story, Peter just wants to say like, okay, well, what's next, right? But at the same time. Uh, we didn't want it to do at the time. This was before multiverses, way before multiverses, right? And so it was before the idea, like, where does this fit? And the idea of doing a reboot was just so, ugh, it just felt nothing against the Daredevil one. But it just like kind of, it, it got to a point where the it was right around when Batman Begins came out, where the audience just was like, I get the origin story, like, but what what's more, right? Like, I, I get mean, that he got bit by something, but like, yeah. where's the meat to it you know we've been beaten over the head with origin, and just to really add to this we've been beaten over the head with origin stories for years and even worse the comic book industry has devolved into shit stories and variants plain and simple yeah and you gotta at some point realize like you're teaching an entire audience like how to think and so what happens when you're raised on comic books and you raise your kids on comic books and then they have kids they don't give a shit about origin stories. They're like, now what do you do with this power? What, like, how does it go wrong? How does it like speak to whatever the issues are at the time? And so this was right around the time when that was happening. And so it just felt like kind of, uh, we didn't really know what the answer was, I think as much. And so the answer we landed on was, I want to make it adjacent to the to live the to the live action series, basically saying that was kind of the canon of what was happening in our world, with a little bit of whatever that inspiration was from the, the adding a little bit of the comic detail. But that was essentially the world that we were in. They'd had those adventures, and coming in on this as being uh, a story about a broken family and a family where the brothers really weren't. It's what happens after you get all the money, after you lose all the money, after you rebuild. And then now you're like, this is it. And this is it for the rest of your life. And what do you do? And a lot of people just aren't really prepared for that long haul. And so I think the idea of that setup was that it could give us a chance for them to be reunited. So it sort of gave us totally just speaking of the, the genetics of story design, right? 
but it gave us a chance to do an origin story without really doing an origin story, but it was a rebirth story. And so that was sort of the, the, the easy thing. And then just to at least acknowledge that they had had these adventures, that they had learned these things. And now what's the next level that they're going, uh, that they're going for. And, and the whole thing really was based around that, that Leo Raff conflict was like from day one. Well, even when I heard that they were trying to get the rights and we were working on another project called Cattail. It was just sort of very Pixar-y kind of, He's a cat who thinks he's a dog, right? Like that kind of thing. And, and I was Sounds there, familiar. Yeah, exactly. it was, <laughs> I was just it was, Nickelodeon it was, tried that already and had a TV about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dude, don't even get me started on cat dog. Cat dog's amazing. Um, and so uh, it's, and, uh, but yeah, so I was working on storyboards and helping them do the storyboards on that. And I heard these rumors that they're working on the, on the turtles or trying to get the rights to turtles. So I just kind of came in every day and was just pitching my guts out of it. Hey, I just had this funny idea about like, what if the brothers were fighting and we put it on a rooftop? like in the rain, which is not original. I mean, like Chuck Norris did it against Coca-Cola. Right? No, like, I mean, like it's not, it was it's, but cool. at the same time, it was, it's cool. It's fucking yeah. cool. It's amazing. I mean, the, it's, it's, the whole it's, dynamic of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was based around a nerd, a party guy, and two brothers who who were too alpha for their own good. Like even even at the age of six, I knew that it was a dick swinging contest between Raph, Raph and uh, Leonardo. Yeah. You know, and it's really funny because it's um, – and, and there's always this thing where people want to look like, which turtle are you? And like, and who's your favorite? And and, and the key that I realized, and I said, I, I mentioned it earlier that the movie was so, it's such a turning point for me because it was, it was probably the first story that I wrote where I needed to make it about something. And it was only because like, holy shit, I got the job. Like I wasn't supposed to get the job. <laughs> I, like I just totally like, like I, whatever it was, I just, the stars aligned and I got it. And all of a sudden you're kind of looking at fade in and you're like, I know, because of all those things like I talked about with Kingdom Come or Kingdom Come, another, we, by the way, we, we tried to pitch and get the rights to Kingdom Come. So we'll talk about that some other time. That Damn it. Next, ep- next episode you're on. We'll talk about Kingdom next Come. Next episode, yeah. Oh, next don't episode. Even get don't even get so, there. We'll get there uh, next episode. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the other one, Kingdom Hearts. Uh, I, and so I was really good at doing big action and not good, but I was really effective at going like, ah, it's going to be big and explosive and we're going to do a bunch of fights and cool stuff. But it was, it was sort of, it was the, it was the Lucas quote that I only ended up sort of later appreciating, which was like, what is it going to be about? And so I kind of arbitrarily picked brothers because it kind of felt natural. And then from there, I kind of extrapolated every one of those characters. And I'd be like, if I, it, it was, and it, it's so stupid. Any writer would be like, duh, of course, that's where you're supposed to do it. But that was the first time I looked at a story where I was like, if I was Mikey, how would I respond to this? If I was Donatello, how would I respond to this? And giving them freedom in my head and possibly it, it encouraged way too many voices in my head that have, have continued since, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was cathartic and it just, it just worked. And so that was, so the story about that was basically about just a fractured family and how do we kind of come together whenever something bigger threatens that. And, uh, and so that was kind of the, the impetus from that. And so to that, the story was about uh, 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 April getting contracted by this. It was sort of Trumpy at the time, but we didn't really mean it to be. Super <laughs> like Trumpy. Back, we, like, random, dude, I... Randomly, the, the, <laughs> ma- the main <laughs> villain felt like Trump. It, it, With it, this huge nothing political here. We don't, we don't do political, but like he was a, no, exactly. he, he was a, bu- a New no, York just, city businessman. Plain and, and that's what that's what it was, right? With this this huge building in the middle of the city, <clears throat> and so um, so he was there, and uh, and so the whole point being was that it, again, it was all about family, and and so the idea of how to tie the villain in, and the idea of the villain was part of the family, and what if his main motivation was that he was just trying to get his family back together again, and he was filled with regret, and he was trying to sort of write filled with anger and regret, yeah, and I mean, so, yeah, and so it was sort of. One of these things where he was this guy and he came off as this eccentric art collector but really what he was doing is he was searching the world searching the world for his his, his brothers his and country. sisters and his his kingdom three thousand year, three thousand years yeah. in the making and you know what I'm, I'm gonna say this and again meet me in the comments if you want to disagree i'll fight you all day long on this one brilliantly voiced by patrick stewart or not Patrick Stewart. Um, yeah, Patrick Stewart. Patrick. Yeah, Patrick Stewart, the the, the final voice. Yeah. yeah, he was, yeah. And, and he was amazing. Like Chris Evans, Captain America is Casey Jones in this movie, people. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it just, you know, it it felt fun. It felt organic. You know, Shredder was very much a piece of it, and man, people just hated it, and I I don't understand. And I've we, we've known each other good six eight got months 100 million dollars it says otherwise but and i i, I, I exactly I, I i i look at the rotten tomatoes reviews and i'm like how the fuck did you give this movie a 31 
It was fun. It was new. It was fresh. The animation that's was fun. That's why. Go, dude, if you want to know why. what that means, go ask a tomato. I mean, Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, fuck. First of all, fuck rotten tomatoes. Plain and simple. But, um, I, I mean, as we were talking about before we went on the air, the, the Internet is a bunch of angry people typing in the caps, lower caps, caps, lower caps, caps, lower caps. I don't like this movie. OK, congratulations. You don't like this movie. But at the same time, you're you're you're, you're taking a dump on someone's livelihood, man. But like, yeah. see the cre- see the creative vision that that came out of this. What what was good about it was that there's so much good about this movie. I will I will go on record and say this, that the the rooftop fight scene between Leonardo and Night Warrior Raph was one of the best animated fight scenes I've ever seen. And I it would... was great. I, I think my favorite part of that entire movie was Michelangelo being a birthday party turtle. <laughs> it, it, it made me smile so much because when I was a kid, there was a party clown uh, Michelangelo figure. And it's to this day, one of my favorite figures. It's I, I wish I grabbed it before we started the show. It would have been right here. I don't want to run off screen and go get it. But it made me smile because he's driving around in a minivan with his head on top of it and everything like that. And it's just like, like there's great there's great turtle humor there there's a lot of easter eggs for those of you who are like me who like easter eggs like there's so many yeah. mentions of like past things like you mention in passing things and it just it it really just it it felt good it felt organic it felt fun i could i could see your love for the project going through it like especially with the story the side story with leonardo going off to be you know a you know a better leader like leadership is is such a an important in a family especially you know there's there's always a leader there's always someone who is the first one to take a bullet there is someone who always wants to talk about you know how we become stronger as a family how we become more bonded as a family leonardo in your movie was that like even his return was epic when he comes in on the hand glider and he just touches the water and he dives in man you you just you you took what essentially was supposed to be made for those 7 and 8 year old kids who are watching ninja turtles with their dads and you made it something that those of us that are diehards that just truly transcend the arcs and the timelines and the stories and you made it fun like i remember seeing that i i just saw the movie for the first time about six months ago myself because this was during a time of my life where i was very indoctrinated in other things and very busy with other things and i'm looking at the chat now uh-huh. and picks and doodles actually said the same thing that rooftop fight was amazing and, and it's it's just one of those things like those like some of these moments felt so big Michelangelo skating. We we were talking about this, and I was hoping. Yeah, what what was what was it that he says? Why would you uh, skate a half like, pipe? Why you could you skate a half pipe when you could say a super pipe? That was actually <laughs> part of the ADR stuff, dude. It was like there's so many parts of the story. It's so funny because then that was the whole period where there, there was like there's a bunch of overpaid like comedy writers that so came good. in, and tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and I think we probably use like four lines in the entire thing. but you know what if, <laughs> you, paid Hollywood, ten, which is if, great. if you paid thousands of dollars for that one line you 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 made out my friend sometimes they <laughs> sometimes they work like that right it was yeah. a, it was a great it was a great line it was um it was yeah. you know but it was fun like even the entire sequence itself like i can see your thought process make it big make it exciting like smalls you watch a you watch a lot of snowboarders and skateboarders on instagram you watch this opening mm-hmm. scene where michelangelo slides down yep. a circular a circular mm-hmm. um staircase and everything it goes it, yep. it was just it was bigger than life and i it was I, I i say that openly i watched the movie again before we before we started the show just to you know really reacclimate myself with it and feel the movie again and like there's a good slow burn in the beginning the comedy's on point you see the build between raf and 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 leo and well I know that this wasn't your vision for the movie. So there's a lot to unpack here and we're going to get to that guys. We are going to unpack this, but it's, it's one of those things where like, what was there, what was presented was fun, at least in my eyes. I'm, I'm the easiest guy in the world to make happy, you know, like where, where He-Man fans are crying about Tila being the main and masters of the universe revelations. I loved it. I loved the different look. I loved an alternate look at evil Lynn. I loved the alternate look at, how Skeletor is legitimately still a pawn of Hordak. I loved Kevin Smith's vision because Kevin Smith, it it was literally like his dear masters of the universe. I fucking love you. I'm not supposed to be here today. Signed Kevin Smith. 
Um, but it was just, it touched my heart. I watched it during chemo and you know, when you're in cancer survivor to cancer survivor here, when you're in chemo, things hit you a lot harder because you're emotional and you're grateful for those things that are keeping your mind off the fact that there's a metal catheter in your, or, or a plastic catheter in your chest. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I have one still. And Somewhere. it's, yep, you know, but it's one of those things where, especially for me, someone who was in a chair for nine hours at a time because I had to be pumped full of Benadryl at the same time, that it was something that just, it really resonated with me because it made me forget that I had cancer. It made me forget how terrible <laughs> life was at the time. It made me forget that my wife was sitting next to me a mess because of what I'm going through as we're going through IVF the past four years to try to have a child. As we're going through our own struggles on top of everything, it made me forget about everything. And like, I kind of felt that way just, you know, watching it again. Like I, I, I just watched, like I said, I watched TMNT before this and it was just fun to sit there. And I mean, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've been a bundle of nerves the last three days. And it was nice to just sit there and like do my research and like watch this and be like, man, this is fucking fun all over again. This is fucking fun. And it was fun and it is fun. But the problem is here is, is I know there's a lot that you did for this movie and a lot of a lot of effort and love you put into it that that Warner Brothers didn't agree with. So I'm just going to. I'm just going to shut up and let you talk about whatever you want with this process development, story writing, why Warner Brothers sucks and why we all hate Harvey Weinstein beyond the obvious. <laughs> so uh, the floor is yours once again, my friend. Now, guys, remember, this is an 18 plus stream. Um, we are not sponsored by anybody to do any of this stuff. We do this because Work. we want <laughs> we want to bring you guys compelling content and stories. Yeah. Next show is going to be a San Diego Comic-Con episode. Don't worry. It's going to be fun. But. Kevin, the floor is yours to talk about whatever you want, however you want. You don't have to be like any other interview you've been in. Just imagine that the fireplace is here and we're sitting there just having a fireside chat, my man. <laughs> uh, dude, uh, I Listen, I think it'll be easier with a question, but let's see. Uh, what uh, What do you want to know? Uh, 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 division. Okay. Um, you know, it's really funny because uh okay how, how do we get to this um i would love to say that this is something where it was like we had this just wonderful Zack snyder vision and oh my god it was so perfect and then the studio came along and fucked it all up <laughs> well they <laughs> really did just... for anybody who's a snyder fan they really no did absolutely i'm not saying that that's not the that the case and I, I would love to be able to thump my chest and say the same with that but i just uh and it's funny, and if you would have asked me this, this question's probably changed about four, four significant times between now and 2007, right? And so where I'm landing now, basically, is uh, looking back, what happened basically is that we had, we had, it was an independent film. We, we went around and we tried to sell it to everybody. Uh, we went around to every single head of the studio and everybody passed uh, on it. And this thing that everybody thought was gonna be a slam dunk turned out not to be and so we had to end up investing money into a teaser trailer and the teaser trailer which was not seen by everybody was basically sort of a lower res version of what the first teaser trailer was with everyone running into the rooftops but it was it was one model and we we duplicated it four times like that's that's how true string it was and we had maybe four buildings and we just kept on rotating all the buildings to try to make them look differently but we had these amazing storyboards that were done by uh this fantastic storyboard artist uh called simeon wilkins who did storyboards for Hellboy, and that was that's all I needed to know. I was in like already on Hellboy, but uh, but and we just got along really great. And he, and it's a shame because he couldn't work on the movie, and we've always been trying to figure out how to work together again. But th his boards and everything, like we just so gelled, like just the idea, like seeing a reflection in the water, and then the foot comes in, all that, just like super, you know, comic y bullshit. But like it's so fun, right? Because it's just so oh, yeah. immersive, absolutely, and so. Yeah, and so we had this whole thing planned out, and we had like the 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 taika drums of the dum 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 as we're running through. And Harvey Weinstein happened to have been in Hong Kong. I think it was two thousand and five. I want to say he was there. Sort of sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm Devin Nervous. Uh, we, we had to stop every time. Oh my god. Um, and so he uh, he swung by Imaji because there because that's what he does, and everybody you know you know everybody you have to swing by. And so he was there, and he saw the trailer, and halfway through this this gray scale version of this trailer 
he like stops the thing and stands up and walks out and he's i gotta call home and so he goes there and he calls him and we got to do this and they just basically buy the movie on the spot they call up warner brothers and they go in 50 50 on it and so the, the the terms of the deal uh basically at the time were basically that we had directors cut so we could deliver the movie that we wanted it was an independent film it's not a studio film right and so it was budgeted at 25 million dollars and uh and uh and so the, the terms were basically like hey if as long as we as long as we stick to the script that was approved uh and that we maintain the look quality that was in that first trailer which we blew away like i mean that thing looks like a you know 1998 sort of cg thing compared to what the final look was but we blew that away and as long as we were under 88 minutes i think it was uh, that basically we would retain cut. And so we worked for like a good solid, like nine months, 12 months or stuff, uh, making this film under these auspices and stuff. And we were all excited. We were showing updates and we finally showed the final cut where we're like, this is it. This is the film we're making. And some of it's an animation <laughs> and, uh, and it didn't go quite so well. And so all of a sudden uh, it, it turned out that the, the, the studio, the studio being mostly led by, by Weinstein, it was, it was, it was one of those things where it was, it was definitely a Weinstein company led, uh, they basically handed the creative over to Weinstein because at the time, when you think about it, he was coming off of Hoodwinked, uh, the world of independent a lot animation. Of kind of yeah. Yep. yeah, and he just yep. he would just buy these these overseas films and he would come in and just rake over the script and do a new ADR pass and do so. But so he was, you know, as far as a studio model goes, who are you going to invest your money in? Like he he had been delivering, so he was sort of trusted to run uh, front lines on it, and then that began. Uh, my my master class in in filmmaking <laughs> and figuring out how the, the business actually worked and so it was and then from there it turned into like a crazy it was probably close to a year maybe like nine months to a year of uh this wonderful eden of us you know of me even this from my point of view not to make it about me but like the idea of just from that point of view of uh, making your first film and oh my god and we got director's cut and we're doing we're doing a ninja turtle movie man that's incredible <laughs> and so like it was just like, these ridiculous things and then only to find out that uh yeah it's it's not quite such a the, an easy road to the finish line whenever there's there's millions and millions of dollars uh, on the line so uh, that was a, that was a funny so to go back to something you said what you're saying is, is there's a director's cut out there somewhere no there is, I mean, but it's, it, but it's, but it's, a, it's a grayscale version. It's never, it never been, because that's the thing with animation is that you yeah, can it goes have black and white cards. and then color. I but mean, then, yeah, I, it never I, gets I'm all for this group attacking social media with the hashtag release the Monroe cut. Cause I would, <laughs> I would kill to see your original vision of this. So, well, you know, it's really funny though, because when I, when I say that, and there's, there's years that I would have totally agreed with you. Right. And wholeheartedly, I still agree with you partially, it was most, mostly ego driven, but, uh, but uh, as time's gone on, it's really funny, especially over the last year and a half. And then maybe it's because of the whole like colon cancer and like getting like super sentimental, <laughs> but not sentimental of the process. But the last two years, the most people that have reached out to me were everybody who were my my oldest son's age, which was around that five to seven at the time. And they were all the people that I hadn't heard from, because, of course, the first opening weekend comes out and you hear about everybody who loved it. You hear about everybody who's like, you fucked it up and it's whatever. And there's no shred, whatever it is, all those people. And you know, everybody up. had their voice for the last 15 years but then all of a sudden all of these kids who are five to seven at this time start to get to this point where they just reach out on instagram or whatever it is and they're like hey i know you don't know me but and it's just, it's just a small note and it's like it's a, yeah. but i'll tell you man every single one of them is all about what it meant to them to see brothers in action what it was to fight with the family what it was so and and so going back to this sort of like director's cut not director's cut we were on a path to make Batman Begins as a Turtles film, right? Unapologetically, but it was it was a bit more. It was a bit funnier because it had just the Turtles comedy in it. But tonally, we were trying to make that movie way more than we were trying to make at the time something that was, hey, it's a super fun family film with like pizza and farts and shit. And <laughs> and but at some point, right? No, but seriously, and you're talking about like it's 2006. Uh, Batman Begins comes out 
and it doesn't show that it's going to be any kind of like family success. And so you're, 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 you're a company and you're like, well, yeah, how are we going to make money back on this? Right. And there's no proven model that anybody wants a dark Ninja Turtles movie. Right. No. And so it's a really hard thing to get someone to commit whatever, 15, 20 million P and a, whenever yeah. they were doing all that. But, if, and but so at then the all, same time, you're coming up against a movie that literally needed a throat loss in Jetty time. He was in a bat costume. Rachel, <laughs> no, no, yeah. Rebecca, I know you're watching. So, Rachel, where are the drugs? Where's Rachel? Where's Rachel? Where are the drugs? Half the budget is lozenges. <laughs> ha, ha, yeah, literally, like you could have gotten Luton's cough drops to fucking sponsor that movie, but the but, you by no, but fisherman's I, friend. I, 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 by Paul's fruit <laughs> racers. No, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and you're right. Well, yeah, turtle comedy is there, but there's been darker turtle properties. Anybody who's read the original source material knows that Krang wasn't named Krang. He was an Udom, and he, he ran a shell company called TCRI. I mean, yeah. but don't get me wrong. The family side of turtles is fun, too. Like, it, it, yeah. like yeah. Uh, anybody but when your age loves farts and pizza. Let's be yeah, honest. but when you're yeah, when, when you're in your movie studio, you 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 kind of want that, and you want that audience, which isn't bad. And that's the genius of Turtles is that you can do it sixty different ways. The premise is so strong that you could do the horror film version of it. That's the extreme version, but you could do well, the that would be Last Ronin. You could do the well, exactly right. And so the whole point is that I think that the premise is so strong, and the thing that it's its strongest. Uh, asset is also the thing that can potentially be the thing that torpedoes it, which is that it can be anything. And so what happens is that you get a movie like this, where in animation, when you are locked with your camera, you're locked with all your animation, when mostly animation is already in mid-process, you can't just go like, hey, let's make it a funny movie. And it wasn't just about making it funny, but it was about how do you add that levity and how do you take out perhaps some of the complexity that we had. For instance, you look at the Max Winters storyline, the, the history lesson now that everyone's forced to swallow for the first two minutes of the film, three minutes of the film. It wasn't a terrible history be, lesson, though. It was cool. It, it, it was, no, no, I know. But it used to be actually organically weaved through the story where it would be a revelation that, oh my God, this is the guy she's working for. So, Whereas the studio mind was basically, no, let's just get that shit out of the way. And let's get on to some turtles fun. And on top of that, all these notes and eventually how it all rolled out were the things that were how to make it more palatable to a broader audience, right? It wasn't really about changing the course story or anything. And so all to say to circle back to that thing where it's it's the people who are reaching out and contacting me the most, all of those studio notes were all the notes to make sure it was accessible to those kids who were that age who were now reaching out. And, and there's something kind of cool about that to me that I, I would love to say like I want to go and have that version of it made and I would love to see that but at the same time I'm kind of like it's different and I don't know if it'd be better though and I'd love to say it'd be better and I would tell you it was better but I'm not sure if it would it'd be different so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna straight out ask it so what you're saying is is that first two minutes where we we find out about winters you, you yeah. weave that through the story and then the reveal comes in I'm assuming act three uh, even before that, I think it was like page 44, 45, so 50. Around at middle of act two, I would assume. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was it was just kind of just stuff like that. And so, like, how can you complain that it's like, is it good, bad? It's different. No, that's I know awesome. It's different. That, that, but that yeah, sounds fantastic. That's like when we yeah. find out that uh, gr great example to to put to this. Uh, I, Chad, I'm sure you've seen this. Kevin, I know you've seen this. Um, Friday the 13th, the original when we find out that Pamela Voorhees is the killer and why Pamela Voorhees is the killer. And she, she unfurls her motives and everything like that. Like if they did that in the first two minutes of the movie, I would never would have gone back for another Friday, the 13th movie. I mean, they did it brilliantly with Halloween, like Halloween. It was done right. Like Michael walks in, sees his sister, you know, doing his thing, her thing. And well, you know, F this stab, stab, stab. He is, but we find out as he goes along, he is faceless. He is mindless. He is, he is just a killing machine. Like yeah. they, they, John Carpenter tells you, Hey, this is the dude who did it. We're bringing him back. He's going to massacre people and we're going to make a franchise out of it. But yeah. it seems like that would have been cooler because, well, first of all, some people don't want to have history crammed down their throats. I, Smalls, I, I think you'd agree with that, right? Yeah. No, sometimes you just want to get to the fun part. You don't want right. to, you know. You don't but want to learn. You want to shut your brain off. If, if yeah. you could, if you could weave everything Kevin just said into a story, like when we find out Obadiah in the first Ob in the first Iron Man movie was the villain, you know, mm -hmm. like it was weaved through the entire story. Like we found out in the end of Act One that he was selling weapons to to terrorists, 
but mm-hmm. we didn't know how bad it was, and it, it progressively got worse. Like, yeah, like, you get little like, bits and pieces along the way. It, it takes a while. It, it takes a while to laser etch the charcuterie board of fuckery. So if that would have been a charcuterie board of fuckery that would have left kids angry and mad, and like you could have made him in, like he could have been Wilson Fisk in, in in as the kingpin. He could have been like you know like in the Spider Man the animated series, which is a a parallel here, just because it's a TV show. You could have literally been like, well, we know this guy's an asshole, but how much of an asshole is he? Let's weave this into the movie and in act three he all of a sudden just goes eh, three thousand years ago i was blah and you know when he just he goes off and tells you why he did it and then he has that coming that coming of age moment where he turns around and he goes you know what i don't want to live immortally anymore i've done it for too long and and he had that in the movie where he goes this is not right and he has that moment but imagine if that got spurled out through the entire movie it would have left people thinking and people don't like to think. That's half the problem. And it sounds like Harvey Weinstein doesn't know how to use his brain because I find that interesting. It's just, listen, it's a matter of taste. And I think there's people who think that just there's the, the attention span. And you're talking about even, and it is, it's not that long ago, but it is a different audience now. And I do think like what we were talking about earlier that I think just shit like that changes. Like it's like you, everyone goes into a movie now and every, like we have, we have 12 year olds and they've been saying this since they've been, seven or eight the concept of plot armor the idea that kids walk around and know the term plot armor and know what that means and we and you think about what that means to a whole population of people who are who are absorbing shows you're you're consuming every show pretty much knowing the hero is going to make it for the most part and if it's not you know that they're really setting you up because they don't want you to be disappointed whenever you go and see it and so as a result to me there's there's this format where i think you can lay those crumbs and people like i get it he's the bad guy and we're going to go there but how do you do it and how you can do it cleverly like not everything can be an m night Shyamalan sort of like oh my god i didn't see that coming but at the same time there's a format by which I think everyone's prepared to live by a couple of rules, right? And then how do you cleverly play with that and deliver a different message each time, right? And so it's just how brave are you to sort of go, to sort of embrace it and then think that the implementation of it is the thing that's going to be the thing that makes it different. I mean, you know? a good, a good example with, you know, the hero being the, the happy ending in the trope. Uh, you've seen Masters of the Universe Revelations, right? Mm-hmm. It blew you away when you saw He-Man die in the beginning of the first episode. Go watch the fucking show if you haven't watched it. It's been a year, people. Mm-hmm. Um, but He-Man dies in the first 35 minutes of the show, and people were mad about that because you, you, you thought the whole show was going to be about him. Even in the beginning, Kevin Smith throws you off when he has Faker on, on Stridor. You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it just... it. It sets you up to not understand what's going to happen. Like I didn't, I didn't expect Randor and Marlena to have marital troubles because of He Man's death. I didn't, I didn't, ex- I didn't expect him to return from his toxic, mag- his toxicity. I didn't expect Men at Arms to be where he was and Tila to find out that the sorceress was her mother and so forth like that. Like there was a lot of things that like I needed expressed from my childhood that were expressed in that and like. It just, it just sounds like we got robbed of that with your movie, man. Like, I'm sure there's more to it than just that one piece. And, like, that alone right there, that was a cliffhanger for me. That was like, whoa. That would have been, like, don't get me wrong. It was good. But it would have been yeah. so much better if we had the ability to have that story weaved through the entire yeah. movie. Like, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of great stuff going on in the movie. I, I, I love the consistent conflict between Leo and Raph and yeah. Raph's consistent anger, even before Raph comes back and his, his ability to be the night warrior and his friendship with Casey, you, you hit on major turtle milestones. Like there, even at the end, the, 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 the Easter eggs in the end, which were, I smiled so hard when I finally got through the entire movie today. And I saw that at the end, when I saw shredder's helmet from one, I thought of my dear friend, James Sato, and I just, I smiled so hard and I sent him a text. I'm like, you've seen this, right? And he goes, yeah, it made me smile too. <laughs> so that was, that was nice to see. That and was hard. Cause that was a lot of that stuff was 3d. And like, we had no reason lovely. to really have half of it. They were all original builds for that shot. And so it was not, it was not a production friendly kind of shot. Cause it's like, no, 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 but seriously, people are going to love it. Cause all these little things and the little, like, and, and the scepter from, from three and all yep, that stuff. And the Triceratops uh, helmet from the cartoons. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Come on. that was like that was really fun. That was in the script from the beginning, so that was that was really cool. It was really, you know, it's funny, and I dug this up because I just found this in the bookshelf that the actual the the oh. the novelization of TMNT, Steve Murphy wrote it from oh. Mirage. Okay, and the thing, 
what was funny is Steve's great. And so the, uh, the studio they had studio. actually written most of the manuscript for the book before that fateful uh, uh, Warner Brothers and, and Weinstein meeting. And so even though the story had adjusted from that point moving forward, probably the truest version to that original cut is this novelization, which is out on shelf. So you can always read it. You can't watch it in, uh, in theater, but, uh, but uh, you can actually read it if you feel like it. Um, I, I'm, I'm always game for something Ninja Turtles. Let me tell you, I, I go back and read the color classics version of the original at least once a year. It's something that I just, I, I love this. They did a good job with the comics too. The Mirage, Mirage came out with a good comic run on that too. A good five, five issue thing. It was fantastic. Yeah. It, the movie story it was, expanded. you know, and I mean, when they brought in Fugitoid and stuff, but Mirage being one thing that's understandable, but I know there's more to this that we missed than just that history being hold on is there no i mean like no you talk are you looking just like what for the differences between yeah, what that original any, story anything was? anything you want to share that you know is of interest to this conversation anything that's of interest to this movie because we're gonna just a yeah. couple of minutes here we're gonna open it up to you guys in chat who are still with us thanks for being here for this long man i hope you guys are loving this we're having fun doing this obviously this conversation we've been, we've been on the air for almost just two and a half hours now and it's just long, yeah. it's it's uh, it feels like it's been 10 minutes it's just it's yeah. and you know what that's when you know you got something organic and you got something good is when you know people are enjoying it people are sitting in the chat and like really invested in this they stop talking and they're just listening and they're hang I, I can just tell i know i know my audience they're hanging on every word you're talking through man and it's Fine. it's awesome uh yeah no so like as far as the you know there's a few things that came out where we kind of uh we lost from the original shooting script there was a whole uh subplot with casey and april where they were really happy there you can see some sort of allusions to it in the movie where they're having relationship problems Oh, but yeah. in our version of it, it actually ended with Casey proposing to uh, April and they were going to get married at the end of the original version of it. And so through that whole thing, oh, it was fantastic. And so he actually, <laughs> he actually, so taped, much. He <laughs> I hope I the, never see you the make the expression again, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I I always knew there was something between Casey and April. Even when I was a kid, I, I said to my dad wow. one day, I was like, Dad, are they married? <laughs> I love the idea of it. And there was something about it. It's and I don't know, man. like it was like there was something cool where they had this relationship, right? And they were living in the same place. And he went out every night and he had to go and just do the shit he had to do. And she knows that he's doing it and she didn't want him doing it. And she didn't want him dressing up like, you know, in his little like sports stuff anymore and going on being vigilante, but he still has to do it. And I just love that tension and putting that sort of, it sounds so adult and shitty. It's like, and we don't put a bad relationship at the core of it, but the idea being that they really were having these like connection uh, issues and these really big communication things and, and just, uh, it was really, no, no, it was really fun. And it was kind of cool. And then when he meets Raph and he sees Raph and Raph is getting to do exactly what he wishes he could do. And somehow Raph was totally at peace with it because Raph doesn't have an April that he's got to answer to, but he actually has like three brothers. And so everyone's kind of stories are all kind of interrelated in that whole way. So oh, no. we had and, that. And, and yeah. the beauty there too is, is you see, you see the, the family dynamic with all of them too, which is very touching. Um, Which you is, see it, you, you see just after seeing this, going back and reading the April and Casey miniseries that I did, um, I, I see a lot of influence in the April and Casey miniseries that IDW did a few years ago in, yeah. in everything you're saying right now. And, and man, I wish I saw this in the movie. I would have been excited. I would have been so you know, cool. All, all of our cut scenes ended up being like IDW storylines, including last Ronin from Nightwatch Ronin. Wait, uh, what? No, I'm just no, 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 no. Don't let's run. Don't make, no, I, I, be, don't make me press the dramatic Spider-Man button. No, 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 no. It's not. No, oh. no, it wasn't. We did not have the last drone. No, not at all. Not at all. It's funny because our proposed turtle sequel was all about was all about Mikey leaving the turtle. Billy's having a hot flash, ladies and gentlemen. You just gave me hot flashes, pal. Billy's got the vapors. <laughs> I got the vapors, ladies and gentlemen. I got the vapors. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Kevin. Well done, pal. Go! <laughs> no, listen, I mean, like, so, yeah, the other stuff, like, what was funny is, I'm trying to think of what the original was, like, I'll open up that script right now, um, because, like, the opening was, cool. I, I just, we opened in the jungle, which was different uh, than opening with all that history lesson, we just kind of got to everything a lot faster, you know, what was really funny was, it, things changed even to the point where, in the in the movie itself, there's a shot where, 
we see Raph when we first see him and he's on his bike and he's like looking out and the and the, the his his bandana's waving and he puts his helmet on and then his bike circles and he leaves like by the by the water that entire thing with the original cut of it was that we came up from new from the sewers after we'd leave Leo in the opening. And I remember we went through all of those city sewer drains and that was sort of our uh, our credit scenes. And then we came up in New York and then you were there and then this foot came across and it was this big foot chase. And there was the, the, the kid who was getting chased mm. by the cops and yada, yada. And uh, and uh, and so then Night Watcher comes in and basically takes over and then takes out the bad guy for them. And, uh, and then we follow this Night Watcher guy as he goes to the water and then his bike pulls in and then he, takes his helmet off and so this was this is probably like one of the, the most clever yet most frustrating and funny changes is that the entire shot is just reversed in the film when you watch it like him actually standing there with his like his, his bandana coming out the whole thing is played in reverse so he puts his helmet on even though the whole shot was done with him seriously pulling him off. yeah like, yeah that's when you watch like it you, you can actually see it yeah Sounds like Warner Brothers walked into the kitchen, grabbed a butcher knife, walked into your bedroom and just stabbed you in the chest while you yelled at them. Yeah, man. No, what was really funny is that it wasn't really Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers were the Warner Brothers were and, and I love Warner Brothers and, and I would I would totally work with them again, but they're never going to work with me. But uh, it's the last uh, Ronin movie, Warner Brothers, last Ronin. Hey, come on in a heartbeat. Uh, and so uh, uh, they they were kind of like just the absentee parent who just wanted to put the movie out and they kind of turned a lot of that sort of that 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 really sort of heavy monkey wrenching over onto uh to to weinstein company and so um yeah it it, it it wasn't so much that as it just like it just there was a lot of stuff that was just like kind of like just changed needlessly and a lot of the stuff was for pacing and what was really funny is that whenever it happened uh, they kind of took over the cut a little bit. Uh, but what was funny is that th at the time, again, thankfully, because it was 2006 or something, it was really hard to transfer files. It was one of those times like, where we, if we'd have to do an output of DVDs, somebody would have to stay there. This, this, this great guy called Brett uh, would stay there for hours and hours and hours until like four in the morning trying to burn like you know the, the, the DVD tower and everything. It would crash at the last minute. And so it was uh, really hard for a studio days. to come in. Yeah, right? And so, yeah. and so it was sort of, uh, well, hey, can we take over the movie? And then so Imaj, and so our defensive move was like, we'd love to, but it's just so complicated. So if you want to, you just have to work with our editor. And so we had in our editor, uh, J.D. Ryan, who I met at Disney when I was doing my, uh, when I was doing all my pilots there. Uh, and he basically was our editor. So even though we had other people monkeying with the cut and like, hey, what happens if we just did this or that? Uh, we always had sort of, I guess, our man on the inside who I know he would probably very uh, passive aggressively be kind of trying to figure out how to steer it back to the way that we all wanted it to be. So it was a, it was a very big learning curve front with a lot of uh, lessons. Absolutely wild. It's just, it, man, this is rad. It's, it's not. But well, to us it is, I mean, we're just, you know, we're citizen A and citizen B man. Like we're just a couple of guys who have a podcast who, you know, love this stuff. Like, don't yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I've been involved in a couple small things, but nothing on the scale of like working with you know somebody, two guys who I I find to be my heroes. What the heck was that? That's the red light, dude. You're getting flashed. No, I think I think I don't even know what just flashed. That was weird. Oh, a light probably died. That's what it is. <laughs> that was weird though like hey light death <laughs> is your wife shutting it down she's like no it's like, like a no, time for bed <laughs> she's actually she's in the she's in the bedroom Turtle. watching but um you, it. <laughs> you know guys i'm gonna uh I'm, I'm gonna shut up and open up questions to our audience guys no channel points put your questions in the chat for kevin um we will we will read them off to him and um, we will we will go from there, guys. I mean, this is this has been amazing, Kevin. First of all, thank you for being on. You know, um, I, I know we really didn't dive into, you know, the, the deeper issue of colon cancer. But I, I will say you guys hear about it a lot. And I'm sure you'll see a lot of Kevin, especially during colon cancer awareness month when we do our live streams. You know, we'll have to do yeah. a stream where Kevin and I play Shredder's Revenge and raise some money for some uh, good some good charities. That'll be fun absolutely and uh that. but uh, honestly this is not the last time that you're gonna see kevin i promise you that 
like this there there is there is more Kevin Monroe in the future because of this episode, plain and simple. <laughs> but uh let's open it up. Um I, I saw some questions were were there. Um, I know some of you guys had questions, so before we let Kevin get on with the rest of his day, because it's only seven thirty in California, <laughs> um, you know, let let's let let's open it up to you guys and ask some some questions. I mean, I I I have some off topic questions of my own, but I'm sure Smalls has a couple of his own. But we'll go last, so open it up to you guys. Let's see what you got, Bassett. I know you had one, and uh, guys, ask away. You know, I'm and, and please, no pitching scripts in the chat. Uh, whatever you do, uh, as I say, there's a 500 character uh, limit <laughs> in yeah, Twitch if, if chat. Gonna, so if you're gonna pitch a script, you got to send it to a bunch of nerds one at gmail dot com, and maybe I'll give it to Kevin if I like it. Or <laughs> can, can find it down to the size of a tweet, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah, 140 characters <laughs> or less, and we'll go from there. Now they up the front. Um, it's 280 now. It's 280. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a movie about a wrestler and another wrestler, and they get in a steel cage. Next, I'll do it. <laughs> there you go. That's, 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 that's the Monroe response right there. It's a job. I'll do it. Fuck You've it, been do Monroe. It. I'll do it. <laughs> well, also one thing I did throw in the chat earlier, and I, I still stand by this, is release the Monroe cut. <laughs> Let's get that trending, guys. Come on. But we should. We can have, we can have a nice uh, storyboard screening sometime. I'm sure. I'm sure someone has. A copy oh, somewhere. I would. There I would love go. to do that. We could do that for our Twitch subs now. All right. Our social. I mean, we did it. Manager. Like, how could we stop? Sorry. No. Why not? No. Fuck it. Uh, yeah. So our social media manager uh, Bass uh, asked, "What was the ex- what was the experience working on Hey Arnold, and some of the lessons you learned from that experience?" Good question. Um, that was my. Um, it was just my first gig, and so um. What was crazy is that it just came right after of all that time when you're in school and trying to learn stuff and, you, you know, you think it's going to be, oh, it's so cool because you see it all the behind the scenes and there's people walking around and they're being creative and they're drawing shit and, you know, and yep. then you get there and you're like, oh, wow, it's cool. And you start and you're like, wow, people are like angry. Like it's just a regular job and people have big days in bed. Day. <laughs> yeah, and so that was kind of the, the, the veil. You're like, yeah, oh, this is you a mean, day like, job was, for them. <laughs> It was funny. And then at the same time, it was the first time I remember specifically, I can't remember. I want to say it was Hank Tucker. Not Hank Tucker. I mean, no, no, it was another Hank. I'm sorry. I'm going to misquote the name. Um, byproduct of chemo. I'm going to blame it on chemo, I, it, even though it's age. But I'm just going to. Chemo brain is a chemo. real thing. Stop lying. <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. Chemo brain is real. And it's just a coincidence that I'm middle aged. So, like, we'll just forget about it. Same. I'm, um, I'm middle aged and I have chemo brain too. <laughs> My, my, and, not that my brain's ever worked, but. But I remember that was the first time because I'd only had sort of um, art teachers up to that point. And that was the first time I remember seeing the guy who was in charge of layouts. And he would, I was sitting there waiting to have my layouts uh, sort of reviewed. And I would draw like the school with the PS, whatever it was on the back. And PS 118. Yep. There you go. And so, <laughs> and I was drawing all like the, drawing all the bricks and stuff. And, uh, mm-hmm. And I would sit there and watch him and he would just get notes on shit as people were bringing him in. And he was just, he was just bang, bang, bang. And he would just take out his blue or his red pencil. And, and that was sort of the first time that I think it really made an impression on me that there's people who were just really good at something and can bring it down to, yep. here's what you want to do. And they just do the two lines and you're like, son of a bitch, how do you do that? How do you know that? And just it's experience and talent, right? So that was, that was a big learning curve there, just realizing that there's, there's a whole world out there like that. Yeah, I will still say to this day, Arnold as as a even as an adult, Arnold has the coolest bedroom that's ever been on TV. I don't Football give a what anyone says. How much do you want that? That oh my god, that room I've oh I if I can ever build a house, that's that's my that's my studio. Yeah. <laughs> hey Arnold, did you know, have I, a really cool room. I will say that. Yeah, there I was that was that feeling. Of- Exactly. <laughs> I know it's it's the dating show. Uh, it's dating me, but the uh, the 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 different strokes uh, bedroom uh, that they had it was just so. And re- and Ricky Schroeder in in fucking uh, Silver Spoons, he had like this millionaire's bedroom, and it was one of those like well, he's got like a spiral slide in it and shit like that. And yep. it was just one of those, as a kid, you'd watch and be like, "That's cool." The I want I that. <laughs> yeah, and that's Arnold. That that skylight. Can you imagine? Oh my god. Oh, dude, it's like that, a friend's it, apartment, right? It's like, actually his rent. Oh, he, like, he oh yeah, he's, it's an Airbnb. <laughs> he was the pioneer of Airbnb. 
Uh, absolutely. I remember cool. the episode when he when he first sees like his first snow, snow of the season, and he just like walks up the side of his room, and just opens the ceiling, and he's just throwing snowballs at cops. Like you can do that. That was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life, and I did that in college, but it was frozen beer cans. But that's another story. <laughs> 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 uh, that deserves a badum for you, my friend. Uh, but that's just that's. I have so many good memories with that show. But the, that's the, cool. You know, finally meeting someone that like worked on something that you grew up watching is just such a. It's a surreal and humbling experience. Like, like no, Rugrats, it's... Hey Arnold, Ren and Stimpy, Cat that's Dog, cool. like all these shows. To know that there's someone behind it that's like drawing it in real time and it's not just you know lines of code it's it's just super it's humbling it's super cool to it's cool to put a face to the show i guess you could say yeah i didn't i mean we've been chatting for months i remember when i reached out to you after i saw the story that the colorectal cancer foundation published i was like man i gotta reach out and just like say hello introduce myself <laughs> you know i mean because guys like you and me it's it's not a very common thing to have people you know, go through what we go through at our age. Like it's, it's not normal, you know? Yeah. I was no. diagnosed at 38. Really? I mean, you yeah. can see, we exactly. have a lot of blue yeah. hair in studio for a good reason. You know right. I mean? But it's, it's one of those things. Like it, it was at a time in my life where I was, I was trying to find someone in my life who understood where I was. So I didn't feel so alone and look at, look at okay. what it's become this beautiful Genesis of crazy things and amazing know, right? it is. And it's, it's awesome. And I'm so grateful for it, but en enough of me splaying my excitement. Um, Amanda had a question, uh, rocket wolf, uh, 78, who influenced your art? Uh, if any, Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, Excellent. probably, uh, yeah, um, I would say probably Chuck Jones. I would say more than anybody, if I was going to look back and say that. Wow. There was just something about that, the the extreme of it. And when I look at it and how it fed into everything, because there have been other touchstones in my life. As like, But like when I think about how much I love Chuck Jones, and then, for instance, falling in love with Earthworm Jim, and that, like, it, that totally makes sense. And then uh, my dad was a huge fan as a kid. I remember of like the big daddy Roth kind of, uh, style that really extreme and like, like really, and just, and you'd like, boom, that's exactly linked to Chuck Jones. Like all of that kind of just clarity and expression. Uh, when I, when I was in Canada as a kid, uh, it wasn't for too long because it didn't sound like, you know, like we, it wasn't like it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a crazy place to grow up, but up until about fourth grade, maybe, uh, we only had, we had like a, the English channel and the French channel for the most part. I mean, we had two English channel and there it was before Nickelodeon it was before a lot of times where you could see a lot of Saturday morning cartoons. It was right before that cusp of everything kind of turning in the eighties. So there was a block of cartoons uh, every Sunday from Quebec that would come in. They were French and, uh, but they were all the classic Warner brothers and all the old, uh, like those Hanna-Barbera ones worked in there. And yeah. it was just a hot um I'm assuming Gay Paris would be in there too because Robert Galay was huge at that time. Absolutely. I know my Chuck right. Jones. I know my Chuck yeah. Jones. <laughs> I and had to so, yeah, my so, names, but yeah. <laughs> and what was funny is like, and, and that I think started the whole love affair with animation for me because it's, it, I didn't need to speak the language and I understood the better animated shows. I didn't have to speak French in order to understand what was happening in the dub. And when you look at, the best of animation, you should be able to turn off all your volume and still be able to follow follow the yeah, entire absolutely. movie. Right? Any, any good filmmaker, I think. And and um, or at least the movies I like. And uh, and so uh, Chuck was by far the, the king of that when you sit back and look at all that. So um, so I would say, yeah, the, the Wiley Coyote, Daffy Duck, like by far, and just like ironic humor and sort of like, ah shit, kind of like expressions, like all that kind of stuff. Like I just, yeah. that just so spoke to me as a kid. And then uh, and then a quick story, then we jumped to when I was working at, um, in at shiny entertainment uh uh and we were kind of wild night and uh, chuck jones had uh, a gallery he had a couple of art galleries there was one in corona del mar that was down there there was another one and uh we got tickets that we could go to a signing with chuck jones it was there and he was going to be releasing some things and so we go there and i was i was so excited dude it was one of these like it was very 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 early at the beginning where i would 
I had a hard time containing excitement, <laughs> harder than that. Uh, and so, uh, and so we're sitting there waiting and it's in this gallery where it's all like the, the, the Grinch pictures and then up rolls the limo and in walks fucking Chuck Jones. And it's just like, he walks in and I just feel the radiance and there's not many people that's happened with, right. But he's one of maybe three in, in my life where I'm just like, holy shit, that's the guy. Right? Yeah. That's so that he was rolls up with Alan he, Bellman. So I guess that. no. <laughs> that's nice. Rest in peace. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and so it's uh, he uh, and so he rolled up and he started saying hello to everybody. And then Chuck gets to me and I'm so excited and I grab his hand to shake it enthusiastically. And I think I squeezed a little too hard and he kind of did this like uh, like that. And he pulled back and yep. I went into this downward spiral like, holy fuck, I broke Chuck Jones's hand. The guy, who, like, <laughs> the guy who created Wiley like, Coyote, I broke his hand. And holy so shit. I just. And so the entire evening, I I kept on clocking. I'm trying to like to see if he was like touching his hand. He seemed like he was okay. But uh, yeah, anyway, so that that sort of never meet your idols because you'll just destroy them. Oh no way! Meet your, <laughs> meet your idols. I, I got a good one now. Now that you said that about Stan Lee, I was in New York <laughs> City, my first New York Comic Con, uh, 2012, 2013. So I walk in the bathroom and I go to take a piss, and I didn't realize I walked into the VIP bathroom. And standing next to me is Stan Lee, and he looks at me and he goes. I think you're in the wrong bathroom, kid. <laughs> and then he looks over and he goes, nope, you're not. <laughs> that's my that's my small experience with that's, Stan Lee. That's how you met Stan Lee. The first time. I've met, I met Stan Lee. Yeah, I met Stan Lee multiple times. I've met many people at a urinal, ironically enough, or in an elevator. But, damn, that Chuck Jones story is rad. I, Chuck I want him to yell Excelsior, by the way. By the way. I, th I, th I thought he was going to say Excelsior when... When he struggled. <laughs> no, no, Stan Lee's a funny bet was a funny bastard when he was not on. I've I I've I've had a drink with him a couple times at some after parties, and he is a very sweet man. Just you know, but like it, it you don't really think about it. Like you're just like you meet him in passing. You know, I, I've met a lot of cool famous people along the way. I, I, I have some really cool wild friends that I've met along the years, and it's just you never realize how, how interesting people are until you really have a conversation with them. Yep. But um, that was way. that Chuck Jones story, probably. And, and I have to agree with everybody in the chat right now. That was the best story ever. Now, like you, I, gr <laughs> I grew up, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up on Chuck Jones too, mm -hmm. like Duck Dodgers, you know, Wiley mm -hmm. Coyote, just the, uh, the yep, twist, the, the, the irony that you weren't supposed to understand as a child. I understood that like, oh, this is his way of saying, oh, well, life's going to throw a fucking 400 pound anvil at you. What do you do? Do you stand there and let it look at you and hold up a sign or do you get the fuck out of the way and go chase the roadrunner again, you know? Uh -huh. And like a lot of life lesson in what he did, like he, he is man he created so many things like i mean cancel cultures come in and kind of robbed us of a lot of those things peppy Le Pew, etc uh because of their feelings on certain things but chuck chuck jones creations may he rest in peace will live on forever because god he was just it's so good. he was twisted and dark but in a fun way as a child yeah so <laughs> all right do we have any other questions in the chat before chris and i ask our questions Do I have a crickets button anymore? I wonder. Wait, I do have a crickets button. Where is it? Nope, that's not the crickets button. There it is. There's 12 of you still here. Come on. <laughs> um, small. Wait, it's like the Jerry Lewis telethon or something. It's just crazy. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Nothing? <laughs> Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Um, Smalls, any, anything before we wrap up? Um, so, I mean, I have just, I always ask anyone, uh, you know, very much like Billy, you know, you meet, you meet certain people and you know, like you meet your idols and all these people that, you know, you get to get to know them outside of their craft and, you know, what they're known for. Um, I always get interested in, you know, if you weren't doing what you're doing, what would you be doing? <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, I'm always interested by this. Book. Yeah, I no, every, it's crazy. Any musician or artist that I meet, I'm like, if you weren't like yeah. playing guitar, like, yeah. what would you be doing? Like, in a bakery, a surfing. Superhero. Like, there's there's part of me that I would say, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Retired hockey um, player. 
Every <laughs> Canadian's dream. I would. Uh, it's really funny because, like, I would love to say, like, no, I'd be the bartender and I'd love to just own a bar and do like, and that would be sort of like the alternate version of my life. But I probably like realizing what I do, what I do, I would probably be figuring a way to create something on some level still, okay. and still making people just go, huh? and that's it, right? Like, because yeah. even when I was in, like, when I was in college and I was working at a deli. I still had to go and like I I I I, I bucked to get the job of like doing the chalk signs of like chicken mm. three ninety nine yep. a kilo because it was Canada. Oh, yeah. I remember and I worked so, at a deli in high school. I remember. And so I started <laughs> doing all these things Same. like where when chicken was for sale, I would I would sketch up a chicken and I'd be yep. like, it was like eat me right. And and I had all this stuff all over the IGF in Halifax when I was there. And then and the manager had to call me in and be like, you might want to just like calm down. But either way, I was always I'm always going for a laugh. I never want to be the one that anyone's laughing at. I want to just be doing the thing that people go like, ah, look at that, that's cool. Yeah, that little yeah. like and that so, little that little quick exhale out the nose, just like yeah, oh, okay. like whatever that is. It's like it's it's even like and I work. I end up working with a lot of musicians i don't know it's probably because of partially because of just the industry and just it's all kind of interrelated and yeah. so i look at that lifestyle a lot and i hear a lot of the same just anecdotes when people talk about finding their way and and why they do what they do and there's just so much overlap like i, I just get it and i'm not like i'm not a musician i wouldn't i wouldn't at all like say that I would do that for a career but like I get it you just sort of like find a way to, to do that so I'd probably be I'd still be writing I would say I would be doing something I, I would just be I'd find contentment in doing yeah. comics or writing books or something yeah just I have, to, I have to get it out of me yeah there's always the you know you ask the one person it's like oh you play like you know you play bass in a band but if you weren't doing this you'd be like you know a beekeeper but you know like right no, there's exactly. always like like there's like just like when uh like when billy had his urinal meeting with stan lee and you with chuck jones uh i had the same thing on my 16th birthday i met steve Vai in boston oh shit oh dude oh, and wow. uh there's and one yeah so that's Talent. one of that's one of the few times i've ever been starstruck and we did the classic someone goes in for a handshake and then the other person goes in for a fist bump. And I was like, I just made myself look like you did the ball and socket to the reason I picked up a guitar. I'm gonna go cry myself to sleep in the Wendy's across the street. <laughs> yeah, that was me when I met Stan Lee, like walking into the wrong bathroom, man. That was fucking hilarious. But I was like, I'll see you at your signing in an hour. <laughs> oh, it's Stan Lee. How good is Steve I in Crossroads, by the way, with oh Ralph Mach? Oh, Devil's guitar player. It's just amazing. I I that's that's such a good I'm movie. actually I'm I'm actually photographing his show in Boston. I think it's in November. He's playing at the Orpheum. No way. Yeah. All right, we got one more from the chats from Picks and Doodles. Uh, new subscriber here. Thanks for uh, following, first of all, and to all our new subscribers tonight. Thank you. There's a lot of you. Uh, my apologies. I'm not going to get a chance to get to all of you tonight, um, but I promise you will be shouted out. Um, let, where did it go? Um, so what's next for Kevin Monroe? It's coming from Picks and Doodles. What stories are you telling next? Do you have anything you can talk about? I mean, obviously, there's going to be a part two. Like, th this interview is far from over, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's really like having we had enough it's a recurring a recurring guest right here my just the intro arc and eventually Kevin. get to the villain arc we, we I know exactly we, we picked the right first guest don't get me wrong i i was i was damn i, I want to be confounded that we're gonna do i it. want to be your john ratzenberger just just ask me back for every movie done done and, and and when we film the superhero movie i'll make it a lead villain i promise <laughs> Uh, what's that? Uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on next, and I'm not even saying it to be quiet just because I the, nothing's really locked in yet. But um, we're starting a new um, CG feature film now that I'm going to be uh, directing, uh, as well as uh, I think we have a couple of uh, really interesting series things that we're getting set up and playing around in um, some live action stuff. I work with a um, an indigenous production company called Seeing Red. Uh, six nations out of Canada yep. and we've been doing for the past few years we've been doing uh, a couple of things like uh, documentaries on social issues uh, indigenous water crisis and I've been sort of helping uh, with uh, writing and producing on that stuff and so we've actually moved over to scripted stuff and uh, it's it's just absolutely insane and I, I I cannot be happier with the stories I'm getting to tell right now and well, so uh, 
Yeah. That one with Red Six Nations, seeing Red Six Nations, I can't wait for that to when that comes up let me know like call me so we can oh we yeah can, no there, can, there's there's a couple of big things coming yeah so we can hammer something out for that because i'm i'm excited for that 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 absolutely, absolutely. yeah no no and those i think both of those are just waiting on press releases and then, then we'll be doing that but uh it was crazy you know and you know this because you went through the whole cancer thing and there yeah. was we had covid and then we had covid pandemic going straight into a year and a half of cancer treatment yeah and it was it's been an incredible downtime and it was a lot of time of spinning plates and getting things going and uh and here we are on the other side of it and there's a bunch of stuff going as a result so absolutely well. absolutely so i'm gonna i'm gonna make i'm gonna give a variation of the question i'm gonna ask every creator who comes on this show um so as a cancer survivor like yourself best advice you would give to someone walking out of those shoes putting cancer in their rear view and looking at cancer and going it's time for me to take over my life. I've I've said it openly. I've said it to Chris. I said it to you off air. I will say it to this audience that this is something in the next year I want to make my day job. I have a lot of reasons for that. Um, some I am not at liberty to speak of yet. Um, when I have the freedom to speak of them, I will. Um, but if you're someone still relentlessly chasing their dreams at the beginning of 40, where would you where would you go? Like, where would you start? What would you do to make them a reality? Oh, my God. I know. It's a tough one, right? Uh, It's really funny because, listen, it's one of those. um, uh, I'm not going to defer to somebody else's quote. Uh, When I was working with George uh, 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 Lucasfilm, he he had this great thing when people would come up to him and say, like, I want to be an actor. Should I be an actor or should I be a director? And he was like, my answer is always no. (laughs) <laughs> and so but what's great and it's a very subtle sort of and this is why he's fucking obi-wan kenobi right is that he's yoda's what he is is that he um is that if you really want it you're gonna say like screw you george lucas i'm gonna be an actor anyway yeah, right exactly. and you know what you need to be an actor that's what you need to be an actor and that's what you need to be a, a director and so I don't really know how it would translate that. It's a really funny thing. I wouldn't be flipping about it and just want to think I could come up with something brilliant, but it would all kind of point back to that same point of view. Like, whereas if you're on that side of 40 and you still want to do it, there's nothing saying you can't. And especially coming out of all that cancer stuff. And 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 the idea that going through that, oh Jesus, I mean, that's a whole, dude, that's a whole show in itself. It the idea of like the, coaster, and yes, the stuff that you go episode. through yeah, and like, and how you come out of it, and 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 how you look at life, and it's not like you're bulletproof. I don't like. I'm just, I'm more scared of things than I was before. But at the same time, I'm so much braver, and just do not give a crap about anything in terms of other topics, including if there's something there which is like a dream, which is a vision, which is if you want to do something that's going to make your life better, and especially if it has something to do to make the world or other people's lives better. I just why are you waiting for it? Just go and do it. You want to get cancer again? Jesus, get to work. No, I, I really don't. And uh, right. I, 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 I said it I said it to Smalls. I, I'll tell you off air. I'm not going to say it publicly. Why I have such a good reason for this to, to metastasize into something serious and amazing. Metastasize being a terrible Fantastic word. Fantastic choice of words, but... It's a, ter- it's a terrible word, but at the same time, in, in this situation... I get it. It's a, but that's how serious it is. But, I get it. you know, I... I, I've come to realize since my diagnosis that the one thing I was doing wrong was I was trying to cater to everyone else and I thought I was bigger than I was. And that has always been my biggest problem is, is I thought I was farther along than I was and then you hit that wall and you're like, well, I'm going to bust this wall down and then the doctor tells you as you let out the most back-cracking air, air pocket out of your ass that you have cancer with no bedside manner and you're like, well, fuck. And then you just you have to change everything up and you have to look at the clock and be like, well, fuck, what do I do now? And, you know, that's where we're at. And like we, we want this to be something because we love creating for the people. We love meeting people like yourself. We love just doing what we do. Like we've been in IT for too long and we just don't want to do it anymore. That's really what it is. Well, you IT, me <laughs> fucking retail. I mean, Re- recently, for me, listen, IT. I, 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 <laughs> Kevin, you, you were there with me. We were at the midnight release for fire. You know, I mean, we, we've been around that long. You know, mm-hmm. I want to spend the next 60 years of my life raising money for colon cancer awareness and just creating fun shit. Fun, simple. 
Amen. All right, guys. Any last questions before we end episode one of the brand show? What a fucking episode it was. Yeah. Holy Thank shit. you, Kevin, for everything. Thank guys, you. No, this is awesome. This is this is easy. This is we, fun. We, we, we put something to paper. And I mean, I remember when I told you, like we said earlier, I remember when I told you about this. And this is exactly what I wanted it to be. And it came together that way. And I'm just fucking blown away that it did. The you fact know? that all of this came out of you literally texting me a single word five minutes after surgery of the podcast, question mark. Yeah. And now we have this eight months later. <laughs> well, not even eight months. Just, four not months. Not even. Four months. Yeah. Four months. But, you know, like this, this has been something I've been thinking about. And I'm going to just get on my high horse for a minute here as we wrap up the show, guys. This is something I've been working on for 16 years. I have not had the right cast or people around me for those 16 years as I've been in this business. And I have wanted this more than anything in the world and it's finally here and having the right people around me the right guests and the right the right crowd to deliver this product to has been a lot of fun so first of all give yourselves a round of applause for being here tonight thank you for being a part of a piece of our history not major history but the brand show and a bunch of nerds history we we love doing what we do uh there's a bunch of new content coming this week including ringside mail call um thanks to my friends over at ringside collectibles christmas in july that's going to be a lot of fun um but there's also a lot of new reels and tiktoks and fun stuff that we're working on also i'm going to be on hey archer this thursday night so head on over to youtube.com slash nerd affiliated it's steve's birthday this week happy birthday steve a little early uh make sure you guys tune in for them to follow kevin over on instagram at kevin munro uh bass if you could put that in the chat that would be great make sure to keep up on all these wild projects he's working on and don't forget to follow smalls and myself at billy nichols brand and at chris small brand now for smalls and for kevin i am the brand i am billy nichols thanks for tuning in tonight we appreciate you guys being here if you're just tuning in late you will be able to see the replay of this on demand on youtube.com slash a bunch of nerds this thursday at 12 p.m eastern time but in the meantime we're gonna see you next in two weeks 7 26 same bat time, same bat channel with our guest, Steve Archer, for the San Diego Comic-Con Hangover. And that one's going to be a lot of fun. So we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of A Bunch of Nerds Presents the Brand Show. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. But for now, guys, bye. Later. You don't like the lights, but it's camera time. Said so take the picture, but you rolled your eyes. Now I'm mortified and still terrorized Push me behind to get me from my better side I wanna push you back, but that's all you want Wanna rub me up, I'm holding back Tryna get me framed, throw me in cuffs Said I attacked you, that's just the false truth No need to argue, and yeah I've had enough You follow me anywhere I try to be alone I find you there There's more to me Everywhere I try to go alone I find you there You follow me So I cannot run free from this Always being watched by you And that's so inconsiderate My privacy, does that exist? Probably haven't heard of it Need to live a different life Cause lights and cameras are in it